Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming. I'm Ken Hansen, I'm an Associate Professor in Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, I do all things light matter interaction, color chemistry, photons driving chemical processes like catalysis, like solar cells, like photomechanical polymers. Uh, but more importantly, joining me today is Rachel Yohei. Rachel, if you wouldn't mind telling people a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at Florida State in the physics department, and I am a high energy experimentalist. I work on the compact muon solenoid or CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's largest, um, highest energy particle collider. And um, what do we do? We smash things together. We smash protons <laughs> together and try to create new states of matter. Um, new kinds of particles and study fundamental forces in nature. And uh, we also build and operate the detectors that allow us to do that. So what do you usually teach? What do I usually teach? Um, completely unrelated stuff. So I've taught the um, the sort of physics for pre-meds class at FSU. Mm. Um, for anyone in the know, it's called 20, 2053, 2054. Um, and I've also been teaching recently um, gen ed astronomy which is a lot of fun because uh, huh. there's more and more um, research connections between astronomy and particle physics, uh, you know, with each passing year, because there's a lot, a lot of interesting physics you can constrain by doing astronomical observations. So I like it a lot. That's awesome. All right. Equally important. What game are we starting with? Uh, we're starting with Pac-Man. All right, let's do this. Blinky, if Pinky, I... Inky, and Clyde. <laughs> Wait, so only call. I play? Yep. Oh gosh. <laughs> yep. So I pay attention to so, chat and you're Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm terrible. Oh, just, no worries. just I don't know if I'm allowed to use profanity on this show. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, we, we Dog do, shit. <laughs> <laughs> we are eighteen plus, and so we can have ah, rage and I'm right and I'm a righty, but I but you but I wanna do this with this in bleh, original controller because I feel like by the end of the night, I'm going to be really good at it. Oh, yeah. No, three hours is but, great uh, practice. You'd be surprised. Yeah, exactly. Like, when do I ever do anything for three hours? I guess I go to work yeah. for three hours. But as a professor, you know, you can't actually do any one thing for three hours because <laughs> there's so much other crap you're, ugh, crap you're supposed to be doing. I, I completely agree. <laughs> Four gathers, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert level science. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Rachel, are you ready? I'll open Capital it up to questions. Capital M for medi <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, we have a rage emote for that. <laughs> All right, we're happy yeah. to open up for questions. Uh, high energy particle physics, physics in general. I guess you've taught enough astronomy. Little astronomy, astronomy little yeah. Little astronomy, but yeah. Expert there level go. science, yes. Deity Sagan makes an appearance in chat. <laughs> oh. Oh wow, we just got two spam bots in a row. Oh no, how do you know? Uh, so they're want to become famous by followers, oh. primes and viewers, bigfollows.com. So there's a. Oh boy. Did you just die? Is there not? Sorry, you should have a cheat code that gives you infinite oh, okay. lives. Try that again. Maybe my cheat code didn't work. Thank you, Scuzzbot, for the uh, deleting those comments. So I tried to look it up. I don't know if this game ever ends for Nintendo. So the original arcade, the stand-up, like, six-foot-tall arcade, it would go up to 255 levels and then run out of memory. Right. I feel like I watched a documentary about this. <laughs> King Do you of know Kong? what I'm talking this about? This Full of Quarters, the Donkey Kong documentary? Uh... I hope it was that one, because that's a superb. I don't remember now, but it was something about people trying to be the best at this game. Yeah. Like, to play it really fast and to... Okay, oh, yeah, there we go. So, I'm guessing oh, it was God. King of Kong. Okay. And the main storyline was for Donkey Kong, the game. Oh, but one, the the bad guy yeah. in it, the, like, <laughs> cliche bad guy, is the was the first to get a perfect game in Pac-Man. It was Billy mm. Mitchell. Yeah. And he has subsequently had his record stripped for cheating, actually. How did he cheat? So I don't think he cheated on the original records, but more recently he started cheating on a bunch of gameplay. Got to his head. Yep, exactly. The glory. And you're number one. He wanted the glory, exactly. Couldn't. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. Can't All right. Calm Don Bronco wants to know, do you have a favorite scientist? Oh, that's a good question. A favorite scientist. 
<laughs> Let's see. I mean, so that's I, not that's an intrinsically hard one because like it's hard to separate someone's science from their personal life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Why, like, yes. They need to be holistic. And um, in my field, so much of what we do is so collaborative to the point that it's sort of like famously we have three thousand authors, you know, on one paper. Um, that we are very attuned to the fact that really big science. To answer really big questions, you need a lot of people, and no one person, like, can really be celebrated as, like, the hero. So I'm used to thinking about, like, efforts, you know, rather than scientists. But, definitely, I mean, I think I respect uh, someone like Marie Curie, um, these early, these early scientists, I mean, it's... It's funny, they had no idea the danger of, like, what they were doing, but they were, like, doing it for the love and the, like, yep. you know... And... I guess they took a few more risks, maybe, um, than we do so much today. Uh, as far as we know. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows, we might find out what we're doing is bad for us, too. <laughs> so, maybe somebody like that, uh, in terms of... There. Sorry, I should really, I should learn to think on my feet a little better. I think this is, uh, this is what I'm being challenged at here. So, another favorite scientist. I'm, you know what? I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to stick with early radiation physicists who did a lot of uh, scary stuff to, to, so that we may understand uh, about all the different... Uh, radioactive decays. I mean, what's awesome about Marie Curie, and we have a chemist and a physicist here, and both of us <laughs> are impacted by her. Like, she won the Nobel Prize in both chemistry and physics mm -hmm. because it was such broad reaching, you know, discover new elements, but also new processes of nuclear chemistry. Like, just blew away everyone. <laughs> a Pac Man re related question. Which angle do you think you're looking at this world in Pac-Man? Top down? But is his mouth sideways? <laughs> <laughs> I, we're going to assume this is four-dimensional. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to describe it any other way. <laughs> That's a really important question. <laughs> what dimension? Or, so, or, or is he not affected by gravity? Because we could have... Oh, meaning is his world... His world is is, you know, 3D plus one time, yeah. or is it 2D plus one time? <laughs> That's a good question. I see, and we just never see him go go up or down. I mean... Yeah. You're on Ask a Scientist Gaming. We ask the important questions. <laughs> so... Oh, there we go. Yeah, nice. finally. <laughs> Level one. <clears throat> oh, wow. Napalm has... We're getting yes, right to the meat of it. Somebody is an expert here. <laughs> what do you think of the luminosity <laughs> upgrade to the LHC and potential for fu future oh circular God. collider will help us understand particle physics? Ah. Um, so so I, first, what is the luminosity upgrade? Great question. So the current LHC um, is scheduled to end operations in 2024. Um, you heard the rumor here first, potentially 2025, kind of depends, pandemic. Um, and it will have collected in the units that we care about uh, 300 inverse femtobarns of data. So it doesn't matter so much what those units are, but the high luminosity upgrade to the LHC, which will um, happen mostly during the next shutdown, so the 2024 to 2027 period, um, I gotta take a second. <laughs> um, uh, that will increase the data set by a factor of 10, so 3,000 in these units of inverse femtobarns. And it will do that by increasing the beam brightness and increasing the collision rate. Um, so that allows you to, it will not increase the energy. And it allows you to access very rare phenomena because the way we make discoveries in particle physics is that. Um, you need to collect statistics. So if something is very rare, you just have to smash more and more and more particles together to be able to get the statistical sensitivity to say that you saw something. So the high luminosity LHC, the main thing that it will allow us to do is to nail down... Uh-oh. Oh, I guess. The, um... Uh, start button. Oh, 
Oh yeah, this is just uh, showing. To nail down the um, Higgs, the rate at which the Higgs, or the strength with which the Higgs couples to the fermions and to the bosons uh, with much, much, much better precision than we have now. And that can help tell us something, because one of the ways we can detect whether we've done something new is to measure something we know and understand and see if it's uh, at the same rate that we expect. Um, the next question was about the FCC? Oh, I hope I answered the first question. I don't know. Um... Yes, the luminosity upgrade. So that's okay. so that's creating, it's, it's not doing higher energy. So it's not, not doing accelerating higher faster, energy. but it's just more. Just more. More protons just being. Just more. Okay. Exactly. And so that's, that's 10 times as many protons, or it's just 10 it's, times as much data? It's, um, it's more tightly packed bunches that will collide more frequently. So I see. Uh, currently you have a bunch of protons that um, in each collision of the bunches, you get on average maybe 40 uh, actual proton-proton collisions. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking that these bunches are, you know, one, one, e t one times 10 to the 11 protons. So 40 of them will actually collide. Uh, in the uh, high luminosity LHC, that number goes up to 200. <laughs> 200 in the same amount of time in the same amount of space. So there's just just many more collisions per second per unit, you know, per cross-sectional area. All right, so more data. So I do, do think you answered the, the second half of that question, which is basically how will that help us understand particle physics better? Um, mm -hmm. Which, yeah, more data, more information, uh, more signals. All right, DK Kohlberg wants to know, Will we learn more about nature by looking at individual particles or more uh, or massive astrophysical objects? So astrophysics versus particle physics. Oh, interesting. Just decide your favorite. <laughs> different, different rules, different scales. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, one of them is an is a I mean, not say an experimental science, but one is one is a lab experimental science. That's what I mean, where you can do controlled experiments. You can have complete control over the parameters. <laughs> of what you're doing and one is an observational science but of course you can you know you can see a lot from an ob uh, observational science so if you take one of the main things that links the two which is the trying trying to understand dark matter i mean everything we know about dark matter you know velocity distribution where it is in galaxies i mean none of that is coming from particle physics that's all coming from astronomy um but to actually nail down the the character of dark matter, I think you have to do you have to do a lab experiment to be sure. So, will we learn more about the universe from astrophysics or from particle experiments? I I, I feel like like over the long long haul, like the next I don't know few hundred years, I think particle physics. However, there are some interesting questions that people are, you know, dark energy, and maybe some of those, the expansion rate of the universe um, in the in the medium term future, um, perhaps some of those big questions are better addressed by astronomy. It's a tough question, because yeah. they're really linked. They're yeah, yeah. really linked. Well, someone is trying to start a fight, mm -hmm. is what I got from that question. <laughs> they all have their own things. Like, when I was an undergrad, I'm like, I hate biology, I hate physics, chemistry is the best, and it's just, it's such a such a small view of what science is and what it does, right? We're all converging on the same answer. It's mm -hmm. just what scale of abstraction are we studying those phenomena? Mm -hmm. And so ideally unified equation describes all of it from what you do to what I do, but <laughs> we're still working on it. Uh, all right, so we have our first request a factoid from a guy doing guy things. It was nine minutes ago, but I thought I'd give you some time to settle in before dropping knowledge oh, bombs yeah, on the audience. Oh yeah, I have to remember what factoids I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could do the 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 scales, Planck scale versus standard physics oh, scale. Oh, that's true. So, the scale at which, <clears throat> at which, what I would call the standard scale is sort of the scale at which our current theories hold, is on the order of a um, hundred to a thousand giga, so billion electron volts. 
and the scale at which effects of quantum gravity were the fact that, um, that, uh, gravity should be, uh, have, you know, a quantizable force the way electromagnetism is. Mm -hmm. That scale is at 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. So it's 17, 17 to 16 orders of magnitude different than the scale at which we know how to calculate things and know how to do experiments. And uh, if one is looking for a, re uh, excuse me, a, a unifying theory of everything, that is a big issue because you need a theory that works at all of those scales. <laughs> Currently, we don't have one. And so that's definitely something that draw, uh, drives LHC and particle physics research. I just want to point out the tragedy of Pac-Man's death, because his mouth gets pulled open <laughs> yeah. backwards and he gets yeah. sucked into a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> Those programmers are dark. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> yeah, and so I apologize for any of the people out there who, uh, you know, think this is like really boring to watch because <laughs> they're just watching me die over and over and uh, over again. Uh, uh, our title literally says mediocre uh, gameplay with expert level science. They know what they're getting into. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, as long as they're, they're but happy. I feel like you're getting better as you play. I feel like I am. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I got to get a little better at timing with the ghosts. Ooh, calm down, Bronco. Do you think we'll have an acceptable unifying theory of the universe in our lifetime? No. <laughs> that was a quick answer. For exactly answer. the reason that I just said. The scales. Because it's very, very hard. I mean, so that unifying theory, not only like length scales, but time scales, energy scale, like everything. They're all, exactly, they're described. all related. So high energy is small length, you know, is, is small distances. Um, and, and... We, we can calculate things at the energy scale we have, and we know we, we, we have a theory that is, it's calculable to high energy scales, you know, but it's ugly. It involves a lot of, uh, uh, having integrals that would just come out infinite and then just kind of like uh explaining to yourself why they shouldn't be <laughs> it's a lot of like ugly math uh it's fine infinities cancel right <laughs> exactly but when they cancel when they have to cancel to 17 orders of magnitude of precision mm -hmm. one part in that many you know it's it's definitely not pretty and so there aren't there are many ideas about things that could um mitigate this our best ones have not have not panned out experimentally hmm. and so we are really left um searching for the same things not really finding anything it's it's tough out there there are a lot of great ideas nothing is showing up in the data and so we just you know it's a it's hard because if you don't have a hint of which direction to go in terms of how to build an experiment you know mm -hmm. you you just you do what we do, build ever larger uh, colliders and just throw, basically throw everything together and literally see what sticks, you know, what comes out of there. In yeah. that sense, it almost is like a strong, like uh, an observational science. It's just, it's sort of a microscope on, you know, we're not looking at the stars, we're looking at particles and seeing what we, what we see because we don't have great, um, great guidance at the moment, mm -hmm. either from experiment or theory. So it's, but yeah, it's playing for me now. <clears throat> it's yeah. giving me a break. Whew, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's in the background. I mean, so that's that's an interesting. So a lot of people have ideas and they want to test these ideas. Obviously, testing those ideas is not free. Do you have an estimate of, and you might not have this answer, how expensive it is to run the LHC? Um, I know how much it initially cost. So it was a $10 billion project. Um, in terms of then, so, so that's the, that's the upfront cost in yeah. terms of then the year to year operational cost. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I do know that we don't run it in the dead of winter because the load on the electricity 
Oh, it's too Rid high. The air or, conditioners. Right, with everyone uses <laughs> using not air well, oh, the heaters, you know, yeah, electric heaters, sorry. heating and in floor heating and stuff in, yeah. in France and in Switzerland would be too high. So it is uh it, it is significant. I feel like when I was when I was a early grad student and I was in the control room at CMS for the for the um we had a nine a, a low energy sort of engineering run. It was really really short, a couple of months um, back in two thousand. It must have been two thousand ten, no, or two even maybe even two thousand eight. Um, and the person who was the spokesperson of the experiment at the time came in and like we were you know we were down. We weren't taking data even though the LHC was. Um, was colliding protons because something was broken. And I feel like I remember him coming in and saying, you know, that's 5,000 francs a minute, you know, that we're not taking, we're not taking any data or whatever. Like, come on, get this thing working again. That's, that's what I was going to say. Well, like when it's <laughs> running full force, it's, it's expensive, right? We're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands yes. per hour. And I believe part of the country of France's contribution, their in-kind contribution is the is the power power the yeah power free. i mean so they it's probably nuclear power right right so they have a lot of uh you know. free power you know they, they they i think they sell power all over europe and so they donated it to the lhc, <laughs> the LHC. that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect all right um s stag all uh scott stag actually howdy dr mm -hmm. yohei enjoying your chat my question is what is your favorite molecule subatomic particle or heavenly body and why <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'll tell you my, I don't know if it's like favorite, but I'll say that my, my like, the subatomic or the, the particle, the, let's say the elementary particle. So more than just subatomic, you know, can't be broken down any further that I am most, uh, that I most respect <laughs> is the tau lepton. All right. Uh, so, so why? Yeah. Um, so there are three families of leptons. So you're all familiar with the most, the electron. That's like our first family. And then there are three families. Why? Nobody knows. Just it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. And the tau is in the heaviest. The only difference between them is they're heavier. Each, each family is heavier than the last. The tau is in the heaviest uh, family. So... This makes it interesting in that um, anything that couples to anything that talks to fermions in proportion to their mass, like the Higgs boson, or theorize new particles that are like the Higgs boson, talks most strongly to tau leptons. So they can be interesting probes huh. of new physics. Then also because they're heavy, uh, they're unstable. So unlike the electron, which of course is absolutely stable, or we wouldn't be here. Um, yeah, you, you would know lots about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, the tau decays, you know, in, I forget, I forget the actual lifetime, but on, you know, at the LHC, you know, at those energies, so with that Lorentz boost, you know, it's, on, it's not even traveling a millimeter before it decays. And uh, so it's, the way it decays then gives it a challenge for how you reconstruct it. So electrons are easy relatively to reconstruct and detect. Um, they just, you you find some material that's got a lot of stuff in it and that hopefully um, scintillates and flashes. Electrons come in, they interact with the material, the material lights up. But um, taus have to decay and you have to detect these, de excuse me, decay particles. And they always, because of the laws of physics, always decay partly to a neutrino, to one or more neutrinos. And neutrinos are undetectable. So they're really interesting they're heavy which tells us you know there's three families we don't know why they're hard to detect but they're really if you can detect them there's a huge payoff because they are heavy so they couple strongly to things that that have couplings proportional to mass so i would say that that is the particle i have the most respect for like it really <laughs> it presents a challenge to the experimentalist but then it like pays it off yeah <laughs> i mean for the general audience we should probably do a particle like roll call so you have electrons protons and neutrons right, right. that's where the chemists start and then you start breaking up protons and neutrons you get quarks mm -hmm. and photons are obviously light particles what else do we have going on um 
Okay, so well, so we talked about the quarks. So the ones that are familiar in nuclei are going to be the up and down quarks. Mm -hmm. But those are only two of the six that we know about. So there are strange quarks. So again, this family structure, up and down are in this first family. Oh. Then there's a second family, charm and strange. And then a third family, top and bottom quarks. And the top quark is very heavy. It's heavier than the Higgs boson. It weighs, this, it's the same weight as 175 protons. <laughs> and it's an elementary particle. Yeah. Okay, so we went through those. Then let's go to the lepton. So we have the electron. The electron has its neutral partner, the electron neutrino. Then there's the second family, um, the charged lepton there. So the one that has electric charge is called the muon. Maybe some people have heard of the muon. Yeah. And it has its partner, the muon neutrino. And then there's the tau and the tau neutrino. Um, so those are all the matter particles. <laughs> and antimatter. So, <laughs> and, and they're antiparticles, yeah. right? So they're yeah. matter so and antimatter. Um, and then uh, the way we conceptualize the interactions between them is that sort of matter particles are talking to each other by exchange of force particles, which we call uh, we we call force particles. We call bosons because mm. um, they obey Bose statistics. The matter particles are fermions. They obey Fermi statistics, and the bosons are um, the W, the Z, the photon. Uh, and of course the Higgs, which is sort of its own special thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I got them all in terms of the elementary particles. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, it's a lot. I mean, it's even, a lot. even from when we were young, right? Like uh, the last 30 years or so, there's been a lot of discoveries or right. evidence that these exist. S certainly so. Since my birth, I was born before the discovery of the top quark. <laughs> no, it was, it was guessed that it would be there because you knew the family structure and they knew the bottom quark existed but no one had any idea what the mass of the top would be so that's yet another um interesting thing why are they why they all have different masses yeah and um in the let's see early two was it early 2000s or or late 90s, that's when they discovered that neutrinos have tiny masses. So hmm. it was thought they didn't have any mass before that um, through the fact that they um, that they change flavor. Mm. <clears throat> Ooh, Maxim Minimus wants to know, what about gravitons? Oh, well, okay. So that is a theorized particle for sure. And so were there to be, you know, if there is a quantum theory of gravity, as we expect there would be, there would be a graviton too. Um, but we don't know how to, because of this energy scale thing, we, we definitely cannot see this or detect it. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's still uh, up in the air whether gravitons actually exist or not. Right. Hmm. Oh yeah, so I was gonna do it. <laughs> Makes sense. So hopefully that answers question about favorite particles. <laughs> That's a really fun question. I would have gone favorite? with a molecule, but yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite molecule? Am I allowed to flip the classroom here? I, yes, we can <laughs> flip the classroom. I mean, so it's mixed. So I have some molecules that are near and dear to my heart, like this pyridol amino isolindol is a, a ligand that I worked on in grad school, and it's basically <laughs> my entire thesis, and putting that on different metals and how it affects photophysics. So that one will always be near and dear to my heart. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we do now with various different molecules. I, I have a few new molecules that I discovered during my career, so that kind of biases it a little. Okay. But then discovered you discovered or like created. Well, created. Okay. I mean, they they might have existed before, but like officially documenting them, kind of thing. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't isolate them. I made them presumably for the first time, but I can't guarantee it. But. Yeah, that's a good one. I, and the other one is for me is photons, right? Photons is my bread and butter. It is everything I do. Right? It's light emission. It's light absorption. It's color chemistry. It, mm -hmm. That is, I, I talk about wavelengths constantly and how molecules behave in the presence of those different wavelengths of light. So, right. so photon is kind of key to everything I do, despite not being traditional chemistry. It's it's the chemistry I love, an old near and dear. What makes it not traditional? I, I think of photon. I think of that a lot when I think of chemistry. But I maybe mean, so it depends. I, I don't want to say a majority of chemists don't use photons, at least not to affect their chemistry, right? Like in terms of if you're doing a solar cell, obviously you need photons. If you're trying to make a cancer drug, not necessarily. 
right? And so there's a lot of people that do nothing to do with photons. But if you're doing photophysics, which is what I do, um, it's all photon driven. It's all light excitation and things like that. Okay. And so um, even in, we'll say undergraduate chemistry, you might do a UV vis absorption, which is t checking the color of a solution, mm -hmm. but they don't spend too much time on that class. It's much more traditional. This bonds with this, this coordinates here. Here's what dictates acid base. I'm not going to um, lie, I I never understand. So many rules, so many, <laughs> like, no laws. Like, yeah, just yeah. remember all these exceptions to the rules. <laughs> yep. And it's it's gotten better, but it's, it's uh, chemistry is a lot of descriptive stuff, especially mm -hmm. undergrad classes. Because you're taking, like, a thousand years of human knowledge of manipulating matter and condensing it into a gen chem classroom, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Are you excited That's... for the fall? <laughs> <laughs> Monday, I start teaching my Gen Chem 2 <laughs> class, 330 students in a room together. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting. Yep. Yeah, we're not allowed to comment on that. <laughs> we're supposed to be positive and optimistic, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. What about gravitons? Um, let me catch up on a question. Uh, Calm Down Bronco wants to know, what is the Higgs boson and why do people call it the God Particle? Oh, okay. The Higgs boson is, well, we're still learning more about it, but it plays two roles in our theory. The first one is has to do with um, how the forces, the electro, the, sorry, the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force unify at high energies. The energies, this sort of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 G, uh, billion electron volts that I was talking about before. We call this um, electroweak unification. So sort of at low energies, the scale of uh, chemistry, say, I always think of Whenever I tell the um, gen, gen ed astronomy students about that, it's like, you know, 13.6 electron volts, that's the binding energy of hydrogen. That's sort of your scale of like, electromagnetism is its own force there. The weak nuclear force is a different thing. The thing that governs radioactive decay of the nuclei. Mm -hmm. But at high energies, they are related. The Z boson is your heavy photon. It's just like a photon, but it has mass. So it's, um, it's heavy and it takes a lot more uh, energy to produce. Uh, and the W is in there too, and the particle that kind of has to exist for um, this, you can either thinking, think of it as this force unification to occur, or sometimes we call it symmetry breaking. The breaking of this symmetry, this unification at lower energies um, is all mediated by the existence of this particle called the Higgs boson. So um, that's why it's important. It's sort of the linchpin that explains um, this unification of the uh, electromagnetic and weak forces. It also um, has the right math to couple to, so if it exists, it should, this is another concept in particle physics that, you know, if a law, if something can happen, it will happen unless there's some, you know, symmetry or whatever or law preventing it. And so if this particle exists, it should also, um, interact with the fermions like the electron or the muon or the up quark or down quark and it can interact it turns out in just such a way that its interaction strength is proportional to their masses or another way of saying it is that the the way these fermions get their mass because there is but without the higgs there is no explanation for why the fermions have mass at all they should all just have zero mass if you put mass terms in into the math um, by hand, it breaks the mathematical, I don't know, calculability of the theory. Hmm. They shouldn't have mass at all. Um, but if you have a particle like the Higgs, it can be the thing that essentially dynamically gives them mass. Hmm. Um, so by moving through this Higgs field that permeates all of space, that is generating the the not the feeling, that's the wrong word, but the sort of the apparent mass of these particles. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, a, it's of course not, you know, guaranteed that that would be true, but it turns out to be true, which is actually really interesting. And you look at, you find that by looking for how the Higgs, um, does it, um, does it interact with the fermions at the strengths that you would expect? Uh, 
including the tau lepton. So that was a big sort of um, observation of the LHC that the Higgs does interact with the heaviest uh, uh, heaviest lepton at the strengths that it should. And so it is the particle that also gives mass. You know, it's that Higgs field gives mass to the fermion. So that's why it's important, both of those reasons. Why is it called the God particle? That's a better, <laughs> <laughs> because um, Leon Letterman, uh, who's a famous physicist who passed away not long ago, um, a famous particle physicist, um, you know, scientists have been, have known about the concept of the Higgs boson since the 60s, you know, uh, of the, the two scientists, the two theorists who won the Nobel Prize for the Higgs discovery, um, Higgs himself and Francois Englert, there are actually three more guys who their papers came out around the same time with basically the same contribution. And, uh, you know, some of them are deceased now, just to say that, like, this was in the 60s this is a long time ago. Yeah. And people have been searching for this particle and its effects for a long, 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 long time, but no one ever knew the mass of the particle. So you think in the 60s, while colliders were only so strong, they can only build, they can only access masses so, so heavy, but finally it took the LHC to do it. Um, and because this is so frustrating, uh, Leon Letterman referred to it as the goddamn particle. <laughs> and some journalist somewhere heard God and dropped the damn and God was born. <laughs> That's the origin of it. <laughs> That's awesome. So it really should be the goddamn particle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, all right. So Codemaster wants to know, I've heard the one-way speed of light can't be measured, but only two-way. I found it interesting and want to know your opinion. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Uh, I think that light travels at the same speed, no matter what, the same, you know, scalar, the same number of meters per second, no matter which direction the photons are going in, up, down, left, right, you know, anywhere. Um, so I think uh, it can be measured and it can be, it will be the same no matter where you do the experiment. And that goes for, you know, on our planet, off our planet, in our galaxy, not in our galaxy, uh, the speed of light will be the same. So I, I hope that clears that up. <laughs> Hopefully. Codemaster, what if it doesn't? We don't think about that. <laughs> That's when you write sci-fi books about someone breaking mm -hmm. the universe. <laughs> what if its speed is different in two directions? I Man, <laughs> we cannot know. That might be true. What if the unicorns are dictating where the photons go? Also might be true, but until you can test it, it's useless. Mm -hmm. So if somebody does find it has directionality, that would be profound. Yeah, but that would be profound. That would, uh, that would imply an ether of some kind, presumably. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think that would have very, because if, if light traveled from you, you know, at one speed and then came back to you faster, like, wouldn't you, wouldn't that break, you know, causality or could, you know, like, <laughs> that know, you would true. know about something or the information paradox or something, yeah, you know, you would I'm know sure. or not time, know about something before it happened. Time travel is embedded in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I agree. So the speed of light has to be. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same, and it, it certainly doesn't have to be the number that it is. I mean, it is that number, but um, but it is the same in all directions. It's a fun thought experiment, though. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're at 938. We should do a, a prediction. Which one do you want to do? Get ready with your internet points, everyone. Okay, so I read it out? Or? No, I'll, oh, I'll put okay. it in. Just pick one of them, um, and I'll do it. How about the first one? Okay, sounds good. So I'll let you know when this is up, and you can play in the meantime. Okay. All right, we'll catch up on questions in a bit, but for now, I'm going to put a prediction in there. Um, it's time to spend your standard internet units, your imaginary internet points on imaginary betting to, I don't know, buy drinks, buy factoids, buy emotes. Um, but yeah, we're going to pop up a question to give you guys two minutes to answer. If you're not following us, click the follow button. You get 300 internet units to gamble accordingly. And I'm going to start the prediction right now, and you're going to have two minutes to answer this question. And so... The prediction is, so, the energy of a Large Hadron Collider bunch, and so that's a bunch of 
of protons. That's 10 to the 11th protons traveling in a bunch around the Large Hadron Collider. How much energy is that? Is it the equivalent of a 55 kilogram human running, human running 10 meters per second or a 150 kilogram motorcycle at 150 kilo, uh, kilometers per hour? And so again, mass times velocity gives you energy. Um, so the question is, what is, you're talking 10 to the 11th protons, which I actually did this math, that is four times 10 to the minus eighth pounds of protons or 0. <laughs> 0.000002 grams of protons <laughs> traveling in the Large Hadron Collider. Is that energy energetically equivalent to 150 kilogram cycle at 150 kilometers per hour or a 55 kilogram human at 10 meters per second? Did that capture the question? <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. You can but... see why my students hate me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this question. Because like 10 to the 11th protons, it seems like a big number, but in terms of actual mass, that is nothing. It's like nothing. that is, again, 0. 0.00002 grams. That is non-existent. That's difficult to measure that much mass. You just reminded me of a factoid, but maybe I should wait for <laughs> We'll save it for somebody moment. requesting it. Yep. All right, who's guessing? So we have two people on a 150 kilogram cycle at 150 kilometers per hour. No one's guessing 55 kilograms human at 10 meters per second. I think they went with the high energy option versus the low energy option. We'll see. If anyone's feeling brave, bet against the popular opinion. You have about 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Throw your guesses in there now. And a bunch is the formal term for a group of protons. Formal that. term, yep. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> we take our bunches, we put them in RF buckets. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect. All right, so time has expired. Rachel, what is the answer? You have a bunch of protons. <laughs> it's the, um, the motorcycle. 150 kilograms at 150 kilometers per hour. That's how much energy is associated One with One bunch. That one bunch and so that's so when they fire it up full speed how often does a bunch go through um every 25 nanoseconds and there will be something like a little over 2,000 bunches like in the machine at the time at a time so every 25 nanoseconds it's a motorcycle going at 150 going, kilometers per it's hour a lot of energy. and so that's effectively two of those crashing into each other head-on yep and releasing yep just signal to every detector possible. And the particles are all going at, you know, point nine 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 nine. I, I, it, it's so many nines, I shouldn't say, because it actually matters how many there are percent <laughs> of the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, it's very close to the speed of light. Very and if you get it going fast enough, that mm -hmm. is so much energy. Again, that's point zero 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 two grams of protons, but with a collision force, the equivalent of two motorcycles crashing to each other at 150 kilometers per hour. That is... That is a really big amount of energy. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't, so I think on time scales, I do a lot of like ultra fast spectroscopy, which is femtosecond. Mm -hmm. And so 10 to the minus 15, I don't necessarily go the other way in terms of scalars, except for like particles and masses. Yeah, femtoseconds. Our big thing these days is trying to time the arrival time of particles to picoseconds tens of picoseconds single picoseconds would be like the, the 10 20 year yeah. future that's um, i mean so that's that's a fundamental problem in our spectroscopy so like when you have a source and a detector that are two separate things trying to talk to each other timing wise mm -hmm. it gets hard right because the time of electrons through the wire the number of spacings the electromagnetic signals mm -hmm. and so we cheat to get to femtoseconds by using one laser pulse splitting it and controlling the time between the two with the distance it travels mm -hmm. and that's that's our loophole to get through it but like with the with the particle accelerator, you're fixed on having a separate source and detector, right? Yes. And so there's there's yes. got to be a fundamental limit how fast those two things can communicate. Um, I mean, the, the fundamental limit is, you know, it's going to be really fast, but there's just many practical limits. I yeah, mean, you have to know practical if limits, you yeah. need to know the precision of the time of arrival to picoseconds, you know, every every way to to send the clock around has to be known to like you know to that level and to that so accuracy, yeah. everything you know a, a clock system that's spread over kilometers right over the lhc ring has to be very very accurate mm -hmm. uh so yeah it's it's a challenge 
All right, catching up on a few questions. Maximinus wants to know, can you comment on how the media covers your field? <laughs> uh, you know? Well, they turned goddamn particle into god particle. There was that. So that's a ding, right? <laughs> not, not, I will say generally, I think uh, the media covers our field fairly. So I'll, I'll give a little, it's got to be a whole story. <laughs> um, when I was a grad student and I was like young and, you know, super in the lab all the time and really into like getting things right, there is a, um, the person who covers physics and astronomy for the New York Times is called Dennis Overby. And I would always read these articles he wrote and, you know, he always would interview these like famous theorists who'd be like, why isn't the LHC on? You know, this is back in 2007, six, when we were like struggling to get all the detectors, you know, in on time and get the thing working, you know, why isn't it on? We're like missing out on really important physics. This is like a travesty that it's not on yet. And like, and then, you know, I would see they would sometimes get slight mistakes and like, you know, the length of the ring or the energy of the particles or whatever it was. And I thought, God, they're such terrible journalists. Like how they're doing the, the worst job, like covering our field. But over the years, as I've grown and I've seen the same writer, you know, cover the Higgs discovery and this and that and the other, I've come to actually appreciate that I think um, this particular journalist does, and I think this is representative, does a really great job, despite, yeah, there'll be a mistake here and there, but does a really great job um, conveying the excitement mm. that we have and why this very esoteric, um, you know, pursuit is so exciting and important to and 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 actually why you know real people are really interested in it and mm -hmm. so i have come to be less interested in the particular like oh did they interview an experimentalist about the cables or like a theorist about the big picture and like did they get the exact um you know fact checks right to more like are they generally getting the tone of everybody's thinking about it right and i think that they do I think most of the coverage has been pretty good. Um, yeah, pretty good, pretty fair. But it's easy, right? We, 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 our science is, you know, the worst thing about it is it's expensive, right? It's not challenging people's, well, it, it's definitely challenging people's, you know, thinking about the universe, but maybe not in such an everyday way that it makes them think about, you know, should I, turn on this light or like install a more energy efficient, whatever, you know, we don't, we're not asking people that we're just yeah, asking yeah. them to open their eyes a little bit to, uh, you know, how many particles are they and are there and how do they interact? <laughs> That's fair. All right. Do you want to move on to Tetris? Yes, that would be probably more my speed. <laughs> All right, time for some Tetris. I mean, that's one of those things for news writers. And I'd like, uh, you've worked with Kathleen regularly in terms of writing the stories. It's like, they have to sacrifice some accuracy that they have yes. to, to convey the message to an average person. And it's like, you have to help facilitate that process. Otherwise it's not going to be communicated correctly. And she's really awesome at that. Like she goes back and forth and she makes sure things are right. Oh man, you should pause actually. Oh, let's, let's do, do a I... reset. Okay. Cause we have not done a bet on gaming yet. So let's do a prediction. How many lines do you think you're going to get? So the record is 315. I like think. total in the night or <laughs> no in the in your first round before dying how many lines yep how many cleared lines 30 all right so this is your first time playing this in a long time how long has it been I mean, I played it as a kid. I'm not going to lie. I have played it before. Oh, it's not me. It's <laughs> I have played it like more recently than that, but not for more than okay, 10 we're, minutes. <laughs> we're going to push you here and we're going to say greater than 40 or less than 40. Okay. Let's do it. Sure. All right. Prediction. We're going to do a game based prediction. Will Rachel get more than 40 lines or less than 40 lines on her first time playing this in 30 years? It doesn't start getting really fast until about 70 lines or so. So I would start on the zero level. We'll see. Wait, cuddly puppy, cu cuddly puppy has faith in you. That's yes. <laughs> Calm down, Bronco says no. <laughs> Who are the believers? Yeah, Tetris 99. Calm down, Bronco has been watching long enough to know that this is a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> well, they haven't seen you play Tetris yet. So right. this is... <laughs> Oh, Cuddle Puppy. Cuddle Puppy. <laughs> I am sorry I get your name wrong. I apologize. <laughs> 
In my defense, your name should be Cuddly Puppy. <laughs> All right, put your guesses in there now. We have about a minute and a half. You excited? This is this is a classic game. Like this yeah. is one that everyone knows. Everybody knows. It's just one of the all-time time favorites. But yeah, speaking of covering science in the news, so we do a process called photon up conversion, which is combining two low energy photons to make a higher energy photon. And so not not the nonlinear optics combining, but through a triplet triplet annihilation process. But like we use that for solar cells, and because it can theoretically bump the limit from thirty three percent to forty five percent. And we had a proof of concept device that did this at point zero 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 one percent. Right. Mm -hmm. The news story that came out from Kathleen and FSU was. You know, scientists come up with potentially a new method for improving solar cell efficiency. Two days later, an article came out saying, scientists have made a 45% efficient solar cell. <laughs> and so they were not just wrong, they were six orders of magnitude wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when I give the talk, I'm like, that's the equivalent of thinking a basketball is the size of the moon. Like, that's how wrong they were in reporting that number. <laughs> but And then sensationalist headlines like that hurt us to some extent, right? Because everyone thinks there's a cure for cancer just around the corner because that's what it's sold as every time. And it's, I don't know. It, yeah. It, it's hard to fix, but... I don't, yeah. Like you said, conveying the enthusiasm is probably the best thing we could get out of it. Yeah. It, and the enthusiasm and getting it you mostly right. Okay. All right. So we have six people saying greater than 40 lines, two people saying less than 40 lines. So go ahead and press start. And right. let's start on level zero. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I know you. <laughs> We'll start you easy. Yep, right That's there. That's great. Okay. All right, 40 lines, no pressure. People have faith in you. No pressure. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm still going to ask you questions during this, which oh, may buy it, bias this in the favor of less than 40 lines people, but so it goes. All right. Um, Calm Down Bronco wants to know, how much of your research is done in person versus theoretical math work? Uh, the... The majority of it is, maybe I'll, uh, I'll say, the majority of it is sort of lab work or coding or, it is not majority math, let's put it that way. Mm. Um, I learned, you know, I had to learn a lot of that stuff in school to like get to where I am, but I don't have to use it on a daily basis, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> But so do you actually travel to the Large Hadron Collider, or you do everything here? Um, we do, it, it's it's sort of half and half. Um, so we we build, so uh, I'm involved in uh, the upgrade, this high luminosity upgrade. We have to build new detectors for it. And um, we're doing a lot of the work here. Um, but then often people will do work at distributed labs and then send it to CERN or then go to CERN to do um, installation and commissioning and, and uh, let's say integration, you know, bringing together of lots of disparate pieces that were built elsewhere. I personally did a lot more at CERN. I mean, as a postdoc, I lived at CERN. Um, I did a lot more at CERN uh, when I was a younger faculty member. So like, for, you know, first kids, <laughs> you know, first move to the U.S., then have kids, then pandemic. And so because of that, <laughs> I haven't been there in a long time now uh, since, um, let's see, we were supposed to go March of 2020 and then that got oh, canceled. Yeah. That's brutal. Um, but my students... Um, one of my students just returned from uh, an almost two year, year and a half stint there, and that's very, very common. And, you know, I have two other students who will be doing the same shortly. And they'll go, and so what people do then is these detectors have to operate 24 7 for uh, basically April through November of every year and they're like battleships and they need a huge team of people to ensure that they are operating correctly because if they're not working um we don't uh we don't take data and so that's basically the statistical power just takes longer and longer to achieve to to say whatever it is you're you know trying to say about nature mm -hmm. and whether you're measuring the higgs or looking for a rare new particle and so, yeah, it takes a lot of work to actually keep these beasts operating. 
So I'm curious, a practical question, how do you fund students going there? Is that through your grants here or is there a program through CERN? There is a program, well, okay, in terms of like getting an RA ship for your students so that they don't have to teach, like that's through our grants here. Yep. But then um, to fund the fact that, so, I don't know how many of the audience has ever lived in Geneva, Switzerland, but it's <laughs> extraordinarily <laughs> expensive. Yeah. It's like living in Tokyo or London or New York City or, you know, San Francisco. And the piddling uh, stipends we pay our students aren't even I mean, are literally poverty wages there. You, uh, when I was a student, I had to lie. I had to claim that I made a certain amount of money per month, and I, I did not make. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. Or they, yeah, That's exactly. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so to cover that cost of living adjustment, there is a large DOE program. Um, they call it the U.S. Operations Program that um, covers these cost of living allowances for the students. Uh, to some level, so it helps them not not completely starve when they live there. <laughs> That's <for laughs> not the like best. they're making any savings, but they're at least not starving. Yeah, 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 and that I mean, in terms of life experiences, like that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. What I tell my students, they're gaining life experience while working for poverty wages. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a weird choice when you put it that way, um, yeah. especially because you know you figure if you're you know, going into hard science grad school, you you know, you could probably do a lot of different things, but yeah. you know, I, I can't tell them that. Yeah. You'll never have any good students. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an, there's a non-trivial portion of physicists that end up being like economists, right? Start writing like machine learning algorithms for stock market. It's a common thing, especially in our particular field, yeah. um, to go into uh, finance or tech or whatever, you know, once upon a time, finance was the hot thing people would do if they, um, once they left um, experimental particle physics, physics, you know, come 2008, that became less hot. And now it's like uh, technology, mm -hmm. uh, data science, all that kind of thing. I mean, it's an amazingly diverse skill set right? that they yes. can make that transition. Yes. So it's very cool. All right. Um, uh, Scott Stagg has another question, another fun question. Do you read any fiction that you find inspiring for your research? If so, what books slash authors? Inspiring. <laughs> I, I, I was looking at this question before and unfortunately the, I think the answer is, I, the answer sadly is no. I don't really have any like fiction books that I'm working on right now that have been inspiring. And some of the fiction that I have read is, is really, uh, it's very much not adjacent to physics at all. Yeah. Um, and that is a little sad when someone asks you that and you really have no good <laughs> answer that answer. most of the things I'm reading are like, you know, books about parenting two-year-olds. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I mean, there's some... Uh, I can't remember what sci-fi book I read, but it was about a, the, the fears of the particle accelerator creating a black hole. And, you know, there's there's... The trashy science novels. Right. And then, but in terms of a really good one, that is a fun question. Is there a movie or TV show that you can think of? That is, like, inspiring for our... <laughs> inspiring or insulting or... <laughs> emo evokes a feeling or an emotion in terms of how you... How they portray. Like, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> yeah. That is, that uh... When I, you know, I've only seen, like, um, a few minutes of the Big Bang Theory. I know it's a little sad to say. I remember thinking, like, uh, like, I don't know if this is weird to say, but, like, uh, do you guys ever, rem you remember watching The Sopranos? Um, yep. So, famous TV show, right, about gang, you know, Italian-American mobsters. And for a while, like, the Italian-American community was, like, a little bit up in arms. Like, why is every TV show about portraying us this way or whatever? And yeah. I remember thinking, like, I think I finally understand that criticism after watching the big thing. <laughs> Being like, oh, this is what Oh, there it America... is, ladies and gentlemen. We are at 40 lines, so... This is what they think of us, we're all... Technically, I think you have to go more or less than... Oh, you got 41. All right, there it is, believers. Did it. Holy cow, Notice greater than 40 lines. Four. Congratulations, sorry Bronco. 
So, so I've heard I've heard Big Bang Theory described as uh, nerd blackface. Like it's a character. Exactly, of, that's a great way of putting a negative it. Actually, conveyance of what we are and what we do. Right. I mean, obviously not to the magnitude of that, but get the idea. The the movie, I would say, it is uh, not not exactly particle physics, but that um, probably best shows that I've seen. Um, the research and like graduate experience um, would probably be something like Contact. Mm, you know, where they're in, in the sense that the kind of person that she is, you know, she's not like a nerd, you know, she's extremely driven, yep. uh, but also like um, willing to go out and like do whatever has to be done to like get the science done, but isn't like, you know, doesn't have, I don't know, like. She's not a sociopath. Well, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, weird <laughs> tendencies as well. Just kind of like a normal, uh-oh, normal person that's um, very, very driven and the kinds of like problems she runs into are also kind of like, oh, you know, just give it up. You know, no one thinks this SETI stuff is worth anything. And and I think people face that um, today too, uh, yeah. those particular researchers. You know, this kind of research is not, it's not fruitful. You know, you're never going to publish. It's not fashionable. So that kind of thing. Um, I think that is all seems very true to... I have to just, you know, now that I did it. <laughs> it's, it's fine. You did it. <laughs> 49. 49 lines. That, you, you said 30. <laughs> they had more faith in you than you did. <laughs> well done, those of you that guessed greater than 40 lines. And that had to be pretty satisfying. <laughs> yeah. In terms yeah. of uh, um, the victory in Tetris. Have you seen uh, Real Genius? The 80s movies with Val Kilmer and the I laser have, lab. I have. Um, that's one of my favorites. That is a funny movie. So um, I was an undergrad at Caltech, and that's like required watching. Because yeah. It's like based on that, you know, in the 80s. And so, yes, I saw it there, in fact. I think I saw it, you know, with my parents, you know, when I was a kid and then there. And uh, it was definitely, I enjoyed that movie. And I will say that a lot of that stuff is true yeah. to life. Uh, At least it was true. in the early 2000s. I mean, it, it kept it captured the characters we engage with regularly, but didn't make it a caricature necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like they were believable within the space. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, not overtly condescending and aggressive, but competitive. Like it, it I, I love that movie. That's one of my favorite classics. <laughs> nerd exploitation. Uh, yeah. Revenge of the Nerds is a whole a nother little. problem. I, that movie has not <laughs> aged well. From right. The, you know, the panty raids to the 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 non consensual consensual sex, <laughs> but Real Genius has aged much better than Revenge of the Nerds. But it is nerd exploitation. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm gonna catch up. We got Calm Down Bronco. Do you have any advice for a soon to be PhD student? Also good. Um, can, calm down. Can I talk to the yeah, yeah? Calm down, Bronco. In physics, I think he is biomedical related. Okay. Biology related. Okay. But there are some brand. There are some cross disciplinary trends that all grad students should probably know. Um, I would say my biggest advice is choose your advisor. Okay, choose your advisor in your lab wisely. Um, it's almost, I think it's more important that you find a lab and a group that you can succeed with than that you are doing exactly the thing you think you are interested in today. You know, you, you, you should have that passion that drives you like, but, um, if the person in your department that does that thing that you think you really want to do is a complete nightmare to work with, and those people exist, not us, of course, but <laughs> no, we're great. <laughs> Those people exist, or, or for whatever reason, maybe they're not terrible people, but you just you just don't get along, and you're not going to be able to do your best science. Try to broaden, you know, put put like being successful and like getting along over doing the exact science you think you want to do. That would be my biggest piece of advice. So get to know and talk to the graduate students yep. in the labs, not just the professor, but the grad students. Find out what's really going on here. Yep. And everything from what's the work environment to like, is this person supportive of future career plans, whatever they may be, you know, or do they go to bat for me when I need it? Um, that's my advice. Yeah. And I think that's universal across all disciplines. One of my grad students, Alex Rob, who might be here, he had a really good question to ask students and not students of a particular group, but students of any group. If you were going to choose a group now, 
who would you choose and why? As in students that have been in the program and worked for one mm -hmm. person, but know a lot about the other research groups, who would they pick? Because it tells you something about culture. It tells you something about reputation. It's, it's not a flawless strategy, but it does give you some insights beyond just the PI and their students who might lie to you, might bullshit, you might have a different perception. Mm -hmm. But other students will, I mean, they'll typically be honest. So yeah, but that's great advice. It's your advisor. The number one thing I say, like I give a talk about lab rotations and orientation. I gave one last week, actually. There's four things you want to really love grad school. You have to get along with the people you work with, which is the fellow grad students. You have to get along with the advisor. That doesn't mean best friends. That just means you have to be able to communicate and work together and be collaborators. You have to like the goals of your project, which is overarching goals is your ideal scenario. Like curing cancer or solving energy crisis or finding Higgs bosons. And then you have to like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you get those four things, graduate school is amazing. Like that, it's going to be the most fun experience you will ever have. Yeah, it is. So it's, it's, um, as we were saying before, um, you, you it's not the most money you will ever make in your life. <laughs> that can true. be, uh, very true. B, I guess. A. I don't know. How do Please I get start. out of the start? Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, there we go. You're on the scoreboard. <laughs> uh, it, it, that can be a, a drag uh, to some people, and it is. Uh, it can and should probably turn off some people if they need to make money at that point in their life. I totally get it. But um, it is a nice time to be really let alone to focus deeply on a research problem without having to manage a team without having to, you know, you do a little bit of teaching, but without having to um, uh, deal with grants or anything like that, really just hone your research skills. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of beautiful because, you know, as time goes on, um, you get to actually do less of that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very true. Then you become a business administrator. Right. But Bronco, I'm glad you got to see the research productivity video. Um, for anyone that's interested, I give a, a talk every year at um, orientation for chemistry grad students, and it's basically advice for research productivity. And so I'll, I'll oh, put okay. a link here in chat. Um, I, I recorded it this year because I it was online rather than in person, so I actually just did the I basically did my PowerPoint with the head overlay here. Um, but basically, the talk is along the lines of. There's a paper from William Shockley in 1956 that tried to like mathematically define research productivity. Huh. And so he basically looked at um, number of papers per person at Los Alamos and Brookhaven Labs. Mm -hmm. And he showed that it wasn't a normal distribution, it was a log normal distribution. Where some people are not just more productive, but exponentially more productive. And he basically broke down and assigned it to it's not just a single task where you'd expect a normal distribution like running a 100 meter dash or the height of people. Instead, he said it's a bunch of stepwise processes and you have to get good at every single step in the process. And if you're terrible at one, you don't do anything. But if you're a little bit good at all of them, your productivity goes up and mm -hmm. it's an exponential relationship. And so then I go into 10,000 hours and how much it takes to get good at stuff. So kind of a fun talk that's one of my favorites to give that makes well, a lot of sense i'd like to see that <laughs> it's a little bit hand wavy because <laughs> it's still you know psychology and it's not well defined but i mean we know there are people that work hard and there are people that don't and those that tend to work hard get more stuff done like that's that's standard amongst our students and amongst our colleagues there's no question there is a trend all right we should do another prediction all right, <laughs> but don't watch the video right now. We're, we're doing Ask a Scientist Gaming with Rachel Yohei. She's an expert in particle physics, particle accelerators, um, talking about uh, smashing things together really fast and figuring out the rules that govern the physics of the universe. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to throw those in chat. Um, or you can request factoids or request that we take a drink. But right now we're going to do a quick prediction. Which one do you want to do? Let's do... Um... This. All right. All right. So I'm going to pop a prediction up there again. If you're not following us, click the follow button and get your uh, 300 standard internet units that you can spend on um, pretty much just this channel is all they're useful for, but they're fun to win nonetheless. All right. So we're popping up a prediction there right now. 
So the question is, a top quark is as heavy as... Um, so if you ba break up, like, neutrons and protons, you get quarks, and those are smaller, obviously. But the question is, how much smaller? A top quark is as heavy as 340 electrons or 340,000 electrons. How heavy is a quark, top quark? Presumably this is specific because the quarks have different masses. Right. Alright, so let's throw your guesses in there. How much does a top quark weigh? Better. It seems like a much cleaner build than your last uh, yes. round. <laughs> yes, I wasn't the... uh, trying to yammer through, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> through it. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's fair. This is a non-trivial task for anyone that's uh, not tried to play <laughs> video games and talk science while being asked questions. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yep. And so I appreciate every guest I have who's willing to do this crazy endeavor with me. So thank you, Rachel. <laughs> it's definitely like a new and exciting way to do outreach for sure. Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of fun. Like even if they didn't show up, I would still learn a lot of <laughs> Yeah, them. exactly. So, I, I'm happy to take it. All right, so 45 seconds. Top quark is as heavy as either 340 electrons or 340,000 electrons. Again, these are very, very small things, but we can measure the masses pretty accurately. I mean, yes. Yeah. To dozens of decimal places. So we actually know the answer. Oh, and Scott Stagg had a follow-up on the the the, uh, the fiction books. He, okay. he recommended Neil Stevenson in okay. terms of some science books. I mean, I do appreciate how out there they think about things. Like there are some just creative ideas and thinking about the world. But um, but he also said he reads parents' books as well. So <laughs> funny, it's good to know. The funny thing is, so we had um, Sarah Hart on. She's a developmental psychologist in the psychology department. Okay. And her strategy is not good parenting. It's good enough parenting. <laughs> And so it turns out it's kind of hard to screw up your kid's bad. And the big thing is withholding love is what does it. If, like, you, you don't demonstrate love for your child, that's what really damages them. But everything else, like, it's 50% genetic, 20% your parents just existing as who they are, another 10% of what schools, and then another 10% of friends. And so a lot of it is already dictated by us as parents. That's so, definitely um, uh, reassuring. <laughs> yeah. That you, you know, you're you're along for the ride, so you just kind of have to like throw your hands up and yeah, love your kid and hope that they. That's good. That's good to hear. I should watch that. It is and, that and episode. It's, <laughs> it's like I mean, if you want your kid to be a top level violinist, that's different than if you want them to just be successful and happy in life. And yeah. If you want them to be successful and happy, supporting and loving is what it takes essentially. And that's and obviously money helps, but yeah. <laughs> We won't get into those details, but that's, <laughs> that was mind-blowing to me, because I, I, I used to do this as an in-person, and she'd be a regular, uh, one of the guests, and it's, I, I talked to her when my daughters were first trying, like, we were first figuring out daycares, and I'm like, which daycare should I do, which one's good, and she basically said, the daycare where you think they're going to survive. Like, if you are confident they're not going to die while at daycare, that is a good daycare, because <laughs> it's really not going to matter that much. And Good it, to know. Yeah, it's like developmentally, it doesn't start impacting until they're four or five years old, and then they're in kindergarten and first grade, and yeah. That is good to know. <laughs> yeah. We've got, I mean, you've, I suppose you have a four-year-old. Yep. So you've gone through some of the tough stuff yep. already. Tell me it, it ends. <laughs> like... <laughs> It comes and it goes. Okay. <laughs> they get yeah. opinions. They, I mean, the terrible threes, right? It's not terrible twos. It's actually the terrible threes when they're monsters. So it sounds like you're getting just past that phase now. Uh, well, he's going to turn three yeah. soon, so oh. we might be just starting it. <laughs> but it does change at four? Yeah, I would say. Like, okay. they, they, they start to understand emotions better and start to deal with them better. Okay. Not good by any means, but yeah. <laughs> but remember, good enough parenting. Good enough, okay. All right, so the prediction is done. The top, top quark is heavy as 340 electrons or 340,000 electrons. And your answer is... 340,000 okay. electrons. And what did people say? It was a five to one bet for 340,000. So generally our audience was right. So nine, 
terms of the amount they bet, it was uh, 98% to 2% for 340000 I think people can tell from the topic, you know, the subject matter of this, uh, uh, not podcast, but, you know, this stream that um, high energy is... <laughs> big numbers are a, are a safe bet. <laughs> well, that's one thing I think about when I... So, like, everyone sends me their questions before they're on the show, and we have a back and forth about it. Um, but the meta-analysis of the question, like the meta-information about who you are and what mm -hmm. your topic is, biases the outcome. Of course. So I think it, it's really hard to predict that ahead of time. And so I guess if we would have put 340,000 versus 3.4 million, it right. might have gone the other way. But right. Yeah. And so that's one of the... It kind of... I asked it because it... it ties into what we were talking about before, but it's one of the great mysteries in the standard model of particle physics. Why Why do all the leptons have such different masses? Why? Why 340,000? Why aren't they all the same mass to within... You know, when you kind of write down the simplest theories, you would think, well, they should all have the same mass to within whatever. Why are these couplings to the Higgs boson all so different? Um, and it's something that we... I mean, we know it has to do with the coupling to the Higgs, but then beyond that, why? Um, mm -hmm. And something else um, that's also related is the Higgs, when we write down a particle's mass, um, or things like masses of particles, or the, the charge of the electron, um, they always receive... Um, it, it's sort of a series. And, and they receive corrections to the series from, <clears throat> um, from interactions, sort of virtual interactions with all of the particles that exist. And the Higgs is especially sensitive to this. So it receive the, the mass of the Higgs is close to this 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 GeV scale, but it receives corrections to, uh, um, yeah, it's getting a little <laughs> tough to explain, but basically it's sensitive to the masses of all of the heavier particles and any energy scale all the way up to, presumably, the, the Planck scale, the, the scale of quantum gravity. And so the fact that it is exactly what it is requires this impressive cancellation somewhere in that, um, in that calculation, and that is, you know, it's just too good to be by accident. That's hmm. what people suspect um because uh you know why would nature have lined things up that way that oh yeah you know the speed of light is this and the higgs mass the, you know this theory predicts it exactly except oh you need to cancel something to one part in 10 to the 17 and so these you know testing out the kinds of ideas that would explain this you know uh is a lot of what we try to do at the lhc mm. Makes sense. So Scuzz, up short. <laughs> Scuzzbot has redeemed Take a Drink. When oh. I'm pausing, start uh -oh. button. Oh no. That one right okay. there. Okay. Yep. Oh, I thought it was like a, he was trying to get me off my... <laughs> <laughs> He's messing with... No, no, we're not betting on lines anymore. Well, cheers, Rachel. Thank you again for joining me on a Wednesday night. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sante. Thank you for, um, yeah, joining me for video games, drinking, and science, uh, as well as everyone in chat. Thank you for stopping by. Hopefully, you have a drink of your own the last week before classes start at FSU. Celebrate with some drinking and science. So, again, cheers, everyone. <laughs> are are we uh, are we talking to FSU students? Uh, so yeah. At least some of them. I know Calm some? Down Bronco is. Okay. I don't know how, how many of the other ones are. But, yeah, it's not... Uncommon for FSU, I advertise this on the uh, Tallahassee subreddit, so okay. yeah, no doubt several FSU students, but also people from all over the country, graduate students in economics and physics and biology, and wow. uh, a few of our former guests like Scott Stagg was on here earlier, as well as others, so, <laughs> and Cuddle Puppy is a student <laughs> of the students. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's from Min Minnesota. Yep, that's wow. my brother. He's the oh, moderator okay. <laughs> of the stream. Yep. <laughs> so we, it's a pretty wide audience. So yeah, again, cheers, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Also, Rachel, how's your German? Do you want to tell them what beer we have? Uh, my German is is uh, not good, but <laughs> it's called um, Einger Brauweiss, and so it's a uh, Hefeweizen. According to the purity law of fifteen sixteen. 
<laughs> it's got requirements. It's very important. Yeah, there's there's rules behind Havo license. But yeah, this is from Germany, so you guys can see. <laughs> kind of, it's got the green screen effect on it. See that reflecting? <clears throat> but anyway. All right, we might as well keep playing. I'll, I'll keep catching up on questions. Um, Faithful Fairy. I remember there was a debate one or two years ago about whether China should dump some billions of dollars to build a particle collider. Uh, Japan, too. What's really out there to get from these expensive toys? Like, is there any new ones planned? There's a lot of idea... There, there, well, there are some ideas, but not... Um, not a lot of movement. So the one in Japan is probably the closest to a reality in the sense that it's... It's the most shovel-ready. It's not like 100% shovel-ready, but like, you know, if, if, if tomorrow Japan said, we have the money and, you know, we had the international collaboration, like... Like, you could probably start doing it within a couple of years, a few years. Um, and that would be for a linear collider. So the LHC is a storage ring, it's circular, and because it's a ring, you just keep going, well, you keep going over and over and over again, and you can use the fact that it's a ring to keep, uh, right, I gotta play this, to keep accelerating the particles to higher and higher energies over and over again in the ring. With a linear collider, like, you only have the length of the, the collider. So they have to be kind of long. Um, but the advantage of a linear collider is that you can collide much more easily electrons. Oh, so that's interesting. Right. And this, here's some more physics, and you were talking about the cost and the power. Um, electrons, um, so... Like, why collide protons at all? A proton isn't a isn't an elementary particle, it's a bag of quarks. When you <laughs> collide a proton, it's extremely messy because each quark, you never know the initial state um, momentum in the direction of the, of the proton because each quark is carrying some fraction of the momentum. Um, you don't know what it is. You, you only know that, you know, it's conserved transverse to the interaction. Um, so... It's kinematically messy, plus you, to first order, just create a bunch of, like, low-energy crap you don't care about, hadrons you don't care about, why do we do this? Um, and the answer is because electrons, um, you can get them to much higher energies for much less cost in dollars. Electrons, um, when they go in circles, they radiate. It's called synchrotron radiation. And at these energies that we need, at the size of the rings we're talking about, the synchrotron radiation is so bad that, I mean, it's costing, you know, you know this is why the, 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 the collider that preceded the LHC in the same tunnel was a, an electron-positron collider. Hmm. And that was the reason they turned it off. It was like, you couldn't, like, run it uh, economically efficiently anymore at the energies that it needed to be able to start to compete to see um, potential hints of the LHC, or, excuse me, of the Higgs boson. But in, in a straight collider, you don't have the synchrotron radiation, so you can... All right, now I'm... <laughs> <laughs> At 80, it got serious. <laughs> that was serious business. <laughs> you can, you can um, collide them, and so you can do a much... If you think about, um, you know, proton collisions, messy, don't know the initial state kinematics very well, um, have a lot of background, a lot of, you know, very hard to reconstruct, need, need to... Detectors need to withstand enormous radiation damage. Electron collider, you know, initial state completely specified, can measure things extremely precisely. Um, the, it's not a, um, it's a real story, but it sounds like it's a, one of these too good to be true things. But um, at the large electron positron collider that preceded the LHC, um, they by the end they got to the point where their measurement of the the mass of the Z boson was so accurate that they could see five times a day, it shifted a little bit. Um, and that was the passing of the TGV, the high-speed train that went from Geneva. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Geneva That's to awesome. Paris five times a day. They, it took a while to make this correlation, but they found that they, that something changed in the slight, you know, um, optics of the beam, yeah. such that the energy got so just a little bit yeah. off and they could <laughs> see that in their measurement of the Z-mass. You could not do that at the LHC, not even close to that level of precision, not even, you know, order of magnitude away. So the collider in Japan would do this and you'd be able to get very high precision measurements of, um, the Higgs couplings, um, 
and, and other things. Um, and so everyone kind of thinks, you know, now that we've discovered the Higgs, we need this sort of linear collider to study it with high precision. And that's still true. Um, and, and some of the other ideas on the market are for a circular electron positron collider that would just be very, very, very large. Mm -hmm. So the larger the ring, the less bending there has Almost to be, linear, yeah. right? The less, <laughs> the less synchrotron radiation, mm -hmm. of course, then you pay for it and you have to dig a giant ring. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and those would basically do the same thing. The, the circular option would get you to more energy. So it's got a little more going, f uh, uh, sorry, more luminosity. So it gets you more collisions per second. Um, they're both good ideas, but there is not an enormous, I mean, the, the political willpower isn't there. Um, uh, certainly the circular electron positron, and that, so that's an idea that China has, um, that requires a lot of civil engineering. Like these tunnels would have to be dug mm -hmm. Um, I think some people were thinking that, you know, well, China's a, it's a big country, it's on the rise, it wants to build its infrastructure, it should, it could, you know, they build tunnels in, you know, lots of places, they could build one there. Um, but it's not clear to me how serious it is. And again, without an international collaboration and uh, uh, behind it, it's hard to do these things. The, the CERN or European version of this, the Future Circular Collider, FCC, I mean, again, that would couldn't even start until after the LHC finishes in 2035. So it's definitely way in the future. So that finishing in 2035, is that just it's not cost effective to maintain or it's just not useful anymore? I think it's more everything is going to be so radioactive and damaged by radiation oh. that it's not going to like work so well. It's already a struggle, a, ch a challenge, let's say, um, to build the detectors such that they will last till 2035. So that would be 10 years of operation. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, who knows? By then you might have discovered something that might want to push you in a different direction. Mm, good point. You don't want to um, commit too long. <laughs> so I think the the physics, you know, the physics of a linear collider it would be good. I mean, it would be, you know, precision on the Higgs. It would probably, it, it probably wouldn't be, you know, an order, an order of magnitude, maybe yeah, maybe one order of magnitude sort of better. I'm kind of, you know, guesstimating here than like, say, the LHC, HL, LHC, but not like two. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, everyone would get behind it if, if it happened, but we don't, there's no site, there's no... It takes a lot of political... You know, there's no... Oil. Exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. like some country isn't going to... So first for a while, they thought they were going to build it in Japan, but then I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Same thing in China. No, You know, and in China, of course, you know, it's unclear how much international observers really know about the, the inner, inner workings of the government and science funding. But mm -hmm. so far as we know, I mean, there's definitely ideas. People are coming up with plans and things you could study and kinds of detectors you could build, but we don't know yet. And same thing, FCC, um, CERN in its, or Europe in its recent like decadal study um, recommended that it be studied. And so it will be, mm -hmm. but again, it's, Know, at least 10 years out, 10, 15 years out. Makes sense. All right, another game of okay. Tetris, or do you want to switch over? What were the other... I could, yeah, I could play Ho Hokum. All right. Because it's, there's no, there's nothing to it. <laughs> there is no... <laughs> so I know, you easier. found the game. We All could right. never figure out what you're actually supposed to do, but... <laughs> so we are jumping forward to 2014 in actual graphics with a play <laughs> PlayStation 3 game called Ho Hokum, where... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It's a beautiful game. It yeah. sounds amazing. The, the, the audio is pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, you guys will see what this game is. All right. So speaking of big science, I'm going to jump to a question. Calm down, Bronco. I'll get back to your uh, about observations and calculations in a little bit. But we have a question from um, the Tallahassee subreddit, and it's from Drug Suck. So we should have probably saved this question for an arc, but... <laughs> Uh, basically says, I don't know about but uh, I don't know much about physics, but I have an aunt who lives in Waxahachie, Texas, and there's an abandoned super collider site from 30 years ago. I have often thought about the failed super collider and wondered what the possibilities would have been if it would have been completed. The proposed project would have clocked in at 20 tera electron volts per per proton 
close to the regime of ultra high energy cosmic rays. It was to have 20 times the collision energy of any existing or planned machine. It would have had five times the energy even today as LHC colliders. Do you think it would have had any discernible difference in furthering new discoveries compared to the work that's performed at LHC? That was a lot. <laughs> yes. Well, first, let's talk about an abandoned super collider. Yes, the SSC, the superconducting super collider, mm -hmm. killed by Bill Clinton in 93, 92, something like that. Um, classic, uh, everyone was for it until they found a site for it. And then everyone who wasn't in Texas was against it. <laughs> no, I think I'm I'm probably uh, paraphrasing a little bit, but that didn't help. Um, so no, I think it was. There's actually a book written about the SSC. I have not read it, but um, but it has been documented. You know, through a combination of a number of things, that poor management, the political winds at the time, blah blah blah. Um, it was canceled after the tunnel was already dug. So it really is an abandoned super collider. I heard there are like mushroom wow. farms or whatever in there now. Like it, it really is. Just How big, big is that? That's like a 20 mile it, or? Yeah, it's in the middle of middle. I don't know where. I don't even know where Waxahachie is, but somewhere, you know, in deepest, darkest Texas, mm -hmm. um, where I guess land is cheap and you could build something really, really big to get to. So the sort of higher energy you, you want to get to, the bigger the collider you need for, say, a fixed magnetic field strength. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, this would have been um, not as luminous, so not as many like collision opportunities per second per square centimeter as the LHC, but each one much, much higher energy. And it would have been different. Um, any process, so some processes are, um, they don't require a high energy but they are rare, and so you need a lot of collisions to detect them. Others, doesn't matter how many collisions you get, if you don't have a high enough energy, you'll never create the particle. Mm -hmm. And so what a 20 TeV, and so for, the, for comparison, the LHC is six and a half TeV per beam. So we're talking 20 TeV per beam. Hmm. Um, anything, um, anything higher energy would have been much more easily accessible by a higher energy collider. And so um, one of the great, one of the theories that has been a long candidate um, in some form or another to explain some of these disparate energy scales in the, in the standard model. <clears throat> yeah, I don't either, calm down Bronco. <laughs> uh, it's just cool. <laughs> You just you have these little friends and so, they follow so, yeah. you around. So my wife described this as little wandering sperm. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think I used the word tadpole to you because I didn't know you, but yeah, that's the uh, word I used. <laughs> yeah, it's just wandering the fallopian. So I think you have to collect all of these guys. I thought they just to, follow me. I think you bump into circles where they are, so you find locations where they are. But oh, okay. But anyway, oh, on here, I see. Yeah. So if you wander around, you'll find <laughs> more of them various different locations so I, I one know. of these um new new ideas and many of the new ideas we have predict say new particles at masses that are just higher than we can imagine so um uh we've probed um one of these new kinds of particles so not discovered but theorized is called a gluino and we at the lhc have probed gluinos up to a masses of around one tv with a 20 tv collider you could go much so go down oh there. i see like anytime you see those Just guys collide into it, collide into that. Yep. Okay. And you start collecting them. I see. I'm not gonna lie, I played this game a little bit. It's a lot <laughs> like fun. <laughs> I test all my guest games because I play a lot of video games, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> so you could discover things like that or or say something about it much more easily. So for example, if this theory that predicts gluinos Let's say it's right around the corner, like the part, you know, the energy scales are such that the gluino is, you know, 10 TeV or something. The LHC has to run for a really, really, really long time, or the high luminosity LHC has to run a really, 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 really long time to maybe probe that. Whereas the 20 TeV collider could probably run very easily uh, and say whether there is a 20 TeV, uh, sorry, a 10 TeV gluino or not where it may be um, less good than the Large Hadron Collider is something that requires a lot of events. So some process that's not particularly high energy, but needs a lot of luminosity. Um, and that would be, 
um, you know, uh, rare standard model couplings. Uh, I wonder how it would have done with um, the coupling of the Higgs, uh, you know, Higgs to muons. I, I wonder if, say, it would have done that as well as the LHC. I'm kind of spitballing here, but that's the basic difference. One, and one. that's cool that I've never actually met anyone even, you know, through this many <laughs> degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever that knew Waxahachie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing we know for sure is cost of living would have been lower. Yes, cost of living <laughs> in, would in have been lower. middle of nowhere, Texas. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's like Oak Ridge, right? It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that, that harkens to a bigger question about big science in the U.S. Like, we spent $15 billion on the Manhattan Project and, like, committed an enormous amount of resources to doing big science. Very, I mean, it was for a bomb, but also a lot was learned during that process. Mm -hmm. And we, we spend a reasonable amount on space travel. Not so much lately, but as we did, you know, 1960s and... Hubble. I mean, why don't we big science in the U.S.? I mean, most of the particle accelerators, most of those big experiments are elsewhere. You, I, we should invite you to give a talk at our decadal planning <laughs> planning survey. Yeah, I mean, that's <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, I mean, the easy the easy answer. Uh, is that, well, you know, the funding agencies have gotten budgets are tight, mm -hmm. no one cares, um, they value more this... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the funding agencies value more, like, you know, doing an analysis on the, somebody else's experiment rather than doing the science to create the experiment that then enables all of that analysis. Mm -hmm. But I think that is a little bit um, not the whole story. Um, because if we actually discovered something revolutionary and new, I think the game would change very quickly. I don't think the funding agencies or the, the whoever, the public, the politicians, take whoever, whoever your boogeyman is, are so uh, anti-fun that they wouldn't be wowed by a new discovery and the, the need for that to like, if you came and said, aha, we actually, you know, we've observed a, you know, a new particle that indicates this, like now we know we need to build a, you know, a, a detector, a collider at this energy or this, whatever, this kind of thing. Um, I think they would be receptive to it. So I think part of it, unfortunately, is that we have the same old questions we've been asking for 40 years and we don't have so many great leads yet. And so then it's hard. People say, well, take a wait and see approach. You know, yeah. we're not going to con commit any money until anything big like that until we have something better <laughs> so cuddle puppy has voiced frustration about your gameplay <laughs> going down <laughs> let's, let's okay. explore a new area okay sorry i'm just yeah. the thing about this game is that so try hitting that thing that might be thing in the middle yep is that uh i thought i had to hit the sides I think it's a combination of okay. things in the middle, collecting those. I, I don't know the rules that game that govern this game, but I mean, so speaking of big science, one of my favorite experiments is the uh, the the uh, super Kamiokande in uh, Japan, mm -hmm. the the neutrino detector. Mm -hmm. And so, for those of you not familiar, they dug a forty meter hole with a forty meter radius, filled the external perimeter with photomultiplier tubes, which is basically a sensitive detector, and these are huge and they filled it up with water just to detect neutrinos. And this is, I mean, billions and billions of dollars towards just detecting neutrinos. And, it's, and before that, I, I believe this is true, um, before that, it was to detect proton decay. Oh, really? <laughs> That's the original, like these giant, like, he, you know, heavy water, whatever. It's like, oh. you just fill up the biggest tank, like least low noisiest tank of water or whatever you can and see if a proton decays yeah. and then you can set limits on like the proton lifetime which is you know older than the age of the universe or something <laughs> and then they're like oh and then we see neutrinos from the sun and, and, and oh we <laughs> they change flavor <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool so yeah i was in tokyo so they had an exhibit at their science museum with that and you could actually see the photomultiplier tubes and they're huge but my favorite backstory on that is 
Um, so the idea behind this is you have a big tank of water, and then when neutrinos go through that water, they make uh, something called, uh, what is it, Cher Cherkov radi radiation. Mm -hmm. It's basically, the analogy I've heard, it's like a sonic boom, but with matter. And so that creates light when it does that pseudo sonic boom. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates a blue halo. And you can actually hit that blue light in the, the perimeter of that. And you can find, a new, I would guess, energy of neutrinos and the speed and all sorts of info, right? Did Right, and just detect the, the presence from the, the recoil of, mm. uh, of other nuclei, yep. But what ended up happening once is one of the, uh, the photomultiplier tubes, which is a vacuum, a glass sealed vacuum chamber, collapsed and it created a shockwave that basically Oops. wiped out about 30% of the photomultiplier tubes. <laughs> so it was like a $20 million five second moment of explosion. Right, you put all those high things under vacuum in a... <laughs> <clears throat> Very heavy, high-pressure environment. Yeah, that is dangerous. Yeah, but I guess... I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I just I have to call out, my cousin is connected. <laughs> Hi, David. I No, I didn't know Billy is a Tetris survivor. <laughs> I, I, I should have figured, because he seems savant-like at other games, so both of you do. My cousins are really into magic. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Great guys. <laughs> Tetris savant. <laughs> the world record is 315 lines. I'm gonna ask him what his line. Yeah, there's this been a revolution in tech, tech techniques playing Tetris. <laughs> but anyway, I guess they're discussing the the now they're gonna call it the hyper Kimio Conde, which is gonna be five times bigger. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they're actually gonna see with that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, the the bigger you make it, the more just the more sensitivity you have per unit time basically to you know if you think about integrating um you know interactions per i'm guessing you, think you gotta to light the all rest those of up the thing? yeah ah, okay interact all those in this area interactions per time per volume um the bigger the volume you know the faster again you can get to if there is some anomaly in the production, or a lot of these things also double as dark matter detectors. Uh, okay, so maybe find the other ones around here, I'm guessing. Yeah. I think there's more. Is there a way to zoom out and see like the whole, I, I thought maybe it was. Oh? oh, is it this? Oh, what is that? Just using yeah. the other. Yeah, that seemed to do something. Yeah. Um, Scuzzbot brings up an important point. Big spending on some projects like James Webb Space Telescope. That's around 10 billion as of today. So yeah, there are, I mean, it's mostly space related, right? We yeah. Still, still um, oh, and we do do yeah, it and something happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I Whoa, I didn't even know it was possible to do anything. <laughs> so I looked up the speed run for this game. I didn't watch it, but I looked it up and it's, uh, 38 minutes. <laughs> so there is a way to win this game. <laughs> Whatever that is, we have no idea. No, I'm glad they're still spending money on big signs, but it's like we've fallen so far behind on particle accelerators. Pull back to zoom out. Okay. But I can't zoom out any more than this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For telescopes, yeah, um, they have. And, ah. And I think James Webb is also like, you know, it's it's been plagued by cost overruns and delays and things like that. Um, my understanding also, it's got some pretty good support from the Maryland like con congressional delegation behind it. Mm. So that probably helps. I don't know. Maybe if I touch them all, something cool will happen. <laughs> <laughs> we you know rules as well as I do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it's it's tough because. I mean, I think about our program officers, and they have to answer to politicians who have to answer to the average citizen to try to justify purchasing something that's going to matter in their day-to-day -day lives 50 years from now. Right. It's a hard sell. Like, yeah. I get it. I it's mean, a hard sell. It kind of has to run... Oh. Yeah, I think, I think it you kinda... beat it. <laughs> I don't, I it kind of has to run um, kind of in the background, you know, without too much thinking about it, but... But then it's it's publicly funded, so of course it can't. We have to, and and to the point about James Webb. I mean, I think Hubble. I think there's no one who could ever really argue the scientific merit of Hubble. I mean, Hubble is amazing, and it helps that it's there's so many pictures they can mm -hmm. point to. And it's pretty. NASA has been so great, and the whole astronomy community about public data releases and mm -hmm. bringing the whole um, the amateur and professional 
uh, community, you know, along for the ride. And so I think that really helps when you say, okay, well, we're, we're, bu we're building the next Hubble. It's like, oh, I guess we, we, we need one of those. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe star. Oh, A, B, green. I'm just like, yeah, trying, trying the different buttons here. Oh. Oh, something happened. Keep hitting buttons. <laughs> we don't know how this game works, <laughs> but it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to jump back. Um, so drugs suck. Hopefully that answers your question. I'll post this to Reddit <laughs> at some point, so you'll get your answer. But I mean, that's crazy. They just have a, a ditch uh, near uh, Waxachati, Texas. That could have been the most powerful square accelerator button. on Earth. Square button. Oh, we're on an Xbox controller. Sorry, I know it's for PlayStation, so try one of those. Any of those? This one. Oh, I see. If I hold down X, it does something. It shakes and it. Yeah. Thank you, Reese's Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> we we accept backseat driving here at Ask Scientist. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We are mediocre gameplay with expert level science. Uh, anyone just joining us? <laughs> my guest today is Rachel Yohei. She's an expert in particle physics, particle accelerators. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in chat. But we are just talking about favorite particles and Pac-Man hitboxes and <laughs> this game that we don't know how to play, but it's beautiful and sounds amazing. <laughs> so, yes, thank you for joining us again at Ask a Scientist Gaming. Have Reese's Pieces. I'm a professional video game controller translator. Well, we are glad you're here because it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Hamsterlicious, welcome to stream. It's always great to have you. Um, yeah, it's going well. We're, we're, we're learning things about Hohokam, a PlayStation game. came out in 2014. Um, it was a battle for me to figure out an emulator for this, but we did it. <laughs> Thank you. Now Rachel is, <laughs> is, is battling through the game. We are slowly learning. Now I bounce a lot. It's kind of cool. Here, I'll draw a flower. <laughs> it's just it's soothing it's like a rock garden yeah you know it's <laughs> all right so i'm going to throw some questions out there particularly work on big science which presumably also work on big mistakes so what is the biggest mistake either like in terms of human damage or in terms of cost that you have seen <laughs> or been personally involved in um that i have seen or i don't know it's occurred in proximity I, I, well, okay, I have two, I have like, you know, in my field or in, in our, in the LHC and then also like specifically in a lab that I worked in. So I'll start with the big one, which is, um, the, the, the incident, the LHC incident of September, 2008. So I don't know how <laughs> the incident, the incident. Um, <laughs> So the collider was, you know, it had been running for a couple of months at a lower energy than it is now, um, and everything was going good. And then all of a sudden, like to, you know, all of these, the, the LHC is um, driven by uh, superconducting magnets that are kept at cryogenic temperatures. This is the magnetic fields to steer the beams. And um, one of the sectors like quenched, like warmed up. So that's when something superconducting suddenly becomes normal conducting and a lot of energy is released because you're carrying all this current and all of a sudden something that had a resistance of zero effectively becomes a resistance of not zero. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm trying to see so if that's I... the thing we hit earlier. Yeah, I gotta zoom out again. Where am I? Yeah, this one. Maybe hit all those. So there was a fault in um, the way this, the sort of solder, electromechanical solder joint between these neighboring dipole magnets was done that caused this, this quench to happen. And so everything behaved as it should. Um, the quench protection system caught it. The, there was a huge helium release in the cavern, which had anyone been down there would have been very dangerous, but no one was. Everybody caught it. It was fine. Um, but it was one year to redo all of the magnet solder joints because it just, I mean, you can look at the picture, like these two things, just, just picture two big metal things, you know, dipole magnets the size of this, I don't want to say, not the width of this room, but like the length of this room that are yeah. supposed to be connected and the, the joint is just... You know, they're not. <laughs> and so that was uh, a whole year to fix all that. So that was the biggest. We're going up. I think there's a ring of these things, probably. I don't know what. I have 
to hit. Oh, maybe up here? It's, it's yelling yeah, at me to do one. Oh, I see. We'll Probably guy. have to hit all of them in order. Okay. Who, who's coaching us through this game? Somebody knows this. <laughs> Reese's Pieces. Oh, like that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you have to get all those or not. And then... Um, so that was a big mistake that cost money, that cost time, that was embarrassing. Uh, it was un unfortunate that it happened, although certainly fortunate that nobody was actually injured. Mm. Uh, then, on a personal level, the biggest uh, lab snafu that I've seen was in my own lab, and I'm... I, I'm do I say the name of the university? You don't have to. Maybe I won't. Okay, when I was a graduate student, so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, look at her bio. <laughs> uh, I wasn't actually there. I was at CERN, but mm. we had a um, an old large bore diameter superconducting magnet, four Tesla superconducting magnet for studying all of the electronics that we were going to put in the LHC for our detector because they all have to work in a four Tesla, sorry, not in the LHC, in CMS, because CMS, the central feature of it is this four Tesla solenoid. And so everything has to work in a magnetic field. So we were studying, in fact, it was um, phototubes. <laughs> um, phototubes, which um, are known to have strange properties in magnetic fields. So we were studying them and uh, I got an, e uh, an email one morning from the graduate student. So I had worked a lot on that when I was a student at this university. And then I moved out to CERN for the remainder of my PhD time. And the younger student um, who was taken over, you know, those studies while I was gone, I got an email in the morning saying, holy shit, there's a pallet jack stuck in the magnet. <laughs> so... If you guys have ever seen a pallet jack, right? It's like a hundred pounds, right? It's made of steel or iron or something. It, it, it's supposed to lift many more hundreds of pounds of pallets with things on it, you know, and whatever. And we had one in the lab to move heavy things around, right? As you do. Uh. And, and uh, this old magnet, you know, the fringe field was not, you know, it extended a few, a meter or two i mean not huge so as long as you keep metallic things like a meter or two away from it like you're yeah. fine but these fields grow very quickly with 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 distance and so somebody left a pallet jack just a little too close <laughs> and it got sucked Her completely oh. i mean it was just a great display of sorry i'm just doing the same one over again yeah. of you know, magnetism at work, and it just got completely sucked into the bore of the magnet, and you can't just pull it out, right? Yeah, you gotta you know, turn it off, so yeah. We de so we, I should, shouldn't say we, but they de-energized the magnet to get it out, oh. and there was a, a safety review and all kinds of stuff, but it was, uh, <laughs> I do have the picture, I don't show it to many people, but it was amazing. I mean, it was really like something from a, from a, um, uh, what not to do, you know, like yeah. safety course about magnets. <laughs> you always sunny in Philadelphia music is correct. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody was hurt. But here, I'll even say just because I because I, th I threw some other people under the bus. Now I'll throw myself under the bus. Um, dealing with that same magnet when I was younger, a student, I was carrying a table in the vicinity of it. And again, you get just a little too close. Yeah. And the table got not sucked into it, but against the side of it. And my finger got caught oh. in between. And I was very, very nervous that I maybe broke it. So I actually went to the hospital to try to get an x-ray. Thankfully, it was it was not broken or fractured. <laughs> but yeah, so magnets, how do they work? <laughs> yeah. Cuddle Puppy said, reminds me of the time I let my cow cause the great Chicago fire. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> we all have those moments and stories. <laughs> oh man, those are non-trivial mistakes. All right, have we hit that I, thing yet? I don't know. Um, no. Oh, it went away. Is that in your control still? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe try down. I don't think we've gone down yet. We're making it up as we go, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Man, big magnets are scary. Like, even the small, like, neodymium uh, magnets, those things are, even one centimeter by one centimeter are finger breakers. Right? If you yeah, know. yeah, that's a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of, of stored energy, exactly. Yeah, because that's the one thing that kind of blew my mind. I think it was an undergrad physics professor, but, like, jumping off a building is scary, right? Gravity is scary. 
but it is such a weak force <laughs> like compared to electromagnetics compared to magnetism like it is nothing <laughs> like yeah. it's not the it's not the gravity that kills you it's the electrostatic repulsion when you hit the bottom <laughs> that's an excellent way of putting it yeah <laughs> um exactly yeah on the you know the scales of the things we're talking about it, mm -hmm. you know gravity doesn't play any role it's only electromagnetism and you we only care about gravity because we live on a planet that is very massive and in a system that is very massive yeah C cuddle puppy gravity is weak compared to my biceps <laughs> that is the nerdiest flex i've ever heard <laughs> all right we gotta explore another area where yeah i can see i think i oh, well, but i thought it just went here yeah, maybe try down is there a down well i i came from down i think yeah if I understand correctly. gravity is weak compared to my biceps. <laughs> yes. With 20 pounds weights, that's probably oh, true. Up. Well, no, that's I came from something. down. Now I'm going up. Oh, I unleashed a an I... oat or something. <laughs> Whatever this exactly. is. Well, I don't think that existed earlier. Oh. What? Did we beat a level? <laughs> 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 We're getting both Carl Sagan and GG's for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome anyone joining us for at. Oh, it was. That was the end of the level. Wow. Oh, now I have mushrooms. Have you ever done level two? Nope. Never seen it. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> All right, flying worms. Didn't even things. know there were levels. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just chilling out playing. <laughs> yeah. Spot, nice uh, beast high five emote. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's just explore things that interact when you touch them. And so this is one of the things I think that's really underappreciated about video games, but I, I say this every time, is they are a quintessential scientific method, right? There mm. are rules that govern the gaming universe that you do not understand, and the only way you figure them out is by trial and error and experiment and hypothesis. And yeah, Apparently that's... I got to another level. <laughs> Probably brought you back to the original. Oh, no. Um, we'll see. Nope. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so go back in now. Oh, no. <laughs> We're back. Is there, is there a reverse good game? Yes. Negative and anti good game? Okay. That is amazing. <laughs> All right. Questions for Rachel regarding particle physics, Large Hadron Collider, any particle accelerator for that matter. <laughs> Please throw them in chat right now while we figure out level two of Hohokam. Uh, PlayStation game. It's available for PlayStation Vita, PlayStation 3 through 5. Um, super relaxing, nice music, chill gameplay. Um, perfect for talking science. All right, Bronco, I, I owe you a few questions here. So let me get to this one first. What are some observations slash calculations that would be needed to help verify things like string theory? Are you familiar with string theory? You don't have to dive into this if you don't want to. Yeah. I, I, I do have David Collins on a guest as a guest list. Yes, so. I'm not going to dive in because <laughs> okay. uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, there's a couple of general predictions of string theory that um, some of them can be tested at the LHC, but they would never be confirmations. They would only be... Um, hints that you know and one of them actually is i believe string theory predicts that there should be supersymmetry which is this um, higher order symmetry between fermions and bosons um, that has been posited um long before string theory i think to explain um some of this you know this spectacular cancellation of the terms in the higgs mass and so were you to observe that, it wouldn't prove supersymmetry because lots of, you know, or excuse me, it wouldn't prove string theory because you could have, um, just have supersymmetry in the standard model, but it would certainly, it would, you know, not disprove string theory, let's put it that way. Um, and the other thing I think is that there should be a, a certain number of extra spatial dimensions. And I, I have this number of like 11 in my head, but there are a total of 11, but I don't know, maybe there are different string theories with different numbers. And so some of these theories with um, extra dimensions predict um, ways that particles would behave in our three plus one dimensions that you could observe. But again, I don't think it's at the level where you'd be able to, where you could falsify string theory, because there could always be just some other explanation. Um, 
you know, string theory necessarily, I, I, it, right, it, it has to do with the fact that the elementary particles are these vibrating strings and yeah, you have to get to pretty high energies, like far higher than we can achieve in the lab today or even in the next hundred years, I think, to really test it. So, so I don't know and I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But if Dave is coming and he knows more... Oh. He will be back. He did one of the earliest ones before okay. we had predictions and factoids and all sorts of stuff sorted out. So was he a good um, yeah he's, gamer? Yeah, he, he's, he's um, he played Battletoads. So I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with that for Nintendo. It is one of the hardest games, so he okay. struggled through the entirety of it. Wow. <laughs> but yeah. Also, what is going on? In I don't this know. Level? <laughs> it's fun. You just bounce off. <laughs> This... Is it? I think if you don't touch it again, then it stays little. Yeah. But I, I it took me a while to realize that. But this probably doesn't uh, get you anywhere. I don't know. Is going over those things matter? This is a uh, our video game version of particle accelerator and collisions. I, I step up. <laughs> that battle toad stream was hard <laughs> to watch. Yes. <laughs> I'll try to follow the I, butterfly. I agree entirely. All right, we should do another prediction. Which one do you want to do? Uh, the top one. All right. That's fun. We've got a temperature question. All right. <laughs> Standard internet points. Get ready to spend them right now. We're going to make a prediction. Uh, ask you a science oh, question, and you can put I your answers in. If you're not following us, click the follow button. Get your 300 standard internet units. We are going to give you two minutes to answer this question, which is, which is colder? The Large Hadron Collider magnets or outer space? Has anyone proposed building a particle accelerator in outer space? <laughs> Maybe we'll uh, wait till this question gets answered so we don't give anything away. But <laughs> I no. imagine an accelerator on the moon, you could go the entire radius of the moon. Hmm. All right, which is colder, the LHC magnets or outer space? Throw your guesses in there right now. What is going on in I this game? I don't know, but I, I don't know how to get out of it now. <laughs> it's like a star I'm just field. trying to avoid, but see, I, mean, I found actually, edges. Yeah, I can exit, and then and now I'm port. gone. Oh. Yeah, I think you're just slightly off the screen. So maybe follow the perimeter. We're going to Jurassic Park this. <laughs> follow the edge and see where it lets you out. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. The coldest thing in the universe is my heart. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I laughed at that. That's hilarious. <laughs> but you are loved here at Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we support that each other. <laughs> <laughs> that it's pretty cold. And it's pretty cold. All right. Reese's Pieces has redeemed. Take a drink. So, Rachel, yeah. cheers. Thank you again for joining us at Ask a Scientist Gaming. Uh, playing Ho Hokum, uh, mediocre gameplay with expert level science. Um, talking particle physics, particle accelerators, uh, all things science. We are happy to discuss them. Cheers to everyone. If you're interested in a good Hefeweizen, this, I, I, li I like this drink. Yes, me too. Um, so I went to uh, Market Square Liquors and said, what do you recommend for a Hefeweizen? And this is what they suggested. So this is imported from Germany. Um, so I can't actually say that. Einger Brausweizen? Something? Close there. You can see it from Nightbot helping me out by giving you guys a link if you're interested. All right, so the which is colder, LHC magnets or outer space? And the answer is... LHC magnets. LHC magnets. We are colder on Earth than outer space. How much colder? I think we have numbers here. A couple of, yeah, a couple of Kelvin. Yep, so outer space is 2.7 Kelvin. LHC magnets are 1.9 Kelvin. So for those of you that said LHC magnets, congratulations on your prediction and enjoy your imaginary internet points and your victory. <laughs> um, demonstrating intellectual superiority with your internet points. <laughs> but that's that's crazy. So 1.7, so it's helium cooled then. It's, yes. It's all helium cooled and then space, it's just yes. absence of heat. It's the, well, the it's the... Um... 2.7 is the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. I see, I see, I see. So I that's see. what people call the, the temperature of outer space. Uh -huh. um, but yes, it's colder than outer space. Um, the colder we run the magnets, the higher the field that can be sustained up, up to a point. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one of the... So what is this thing? 
There's, yeah. There might be an entryway to this thing. Oh. So I'm not Somewhere. sure. Jurassic Park. One of the things that um, actually would make accelerators cheaper, uh, future accelerators to get to higher energies, is to have stronger magnets mm -hmm. um, that can achieve higher fields. Because the stronger the field, the faster the particles can go in, say, a fixed ring size. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than otherwise, um, you need to make a bigger ring to get them to go faster. And, uh, you know, there's there's an idea for the far, far future. There's an this thing. Oh, oh, to get into this thing. Let's see. I mean, I got to assume that's oh, yeah. important. The far, far future to build a 100 TeV Hadron Collider. And that would probably require some breakthrough in... I don't know, uh, maglab type stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, like new kind of superconducting materials yeah. that would allow them to sustain even higher fields at, you know, reasonable cryogenic temperatures. Oh no, Reese's Pieces pointed out this is where we came from. <laughs> <laughs> we come full circle. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. All right. See, you zoom out, but you, of course, can't see everything. My, my thesis advisor for my master's work on one of the first stage accelerators worked on one of the first stage accelerators, I believe. The small one that brings particles up to speed before they're sent to the main collider. Okay. That's awesome. At CERN or here in the U.S.? That's a good question. In Texas? Nope. It's just a ditch. Sorry. <laughs> so it goes. All right, um, calm down. Oh, this is a fun one and a, a mainstay of Ask a Scientist Gaming. If you had unlimited funds and no morals, <laughs> no moral qualms, <laughs> what experiment would you perform? <laughs> and so to give you some context, um, like Sarah Hart said, she would breed twins and separate them to study the effects. Um, Matt Hauer said he would um, put ankle bracelet monitors on everyone and send hurricanes out of city. So when answering this question, <laughs> think big. <laughs> <laughs> no moral qualms, unlimited budget. What I mean, particle that? accelerator in, you know, biggest, baddest particle accelerator you could possibly build in space. Um, I mean, the biggest moral qualm for us would be... Down is what Reese's Pieces says. Okay. It has not guided us wrong so far. Um, would be energy usage. So, for example, like a giant electron-positron collider that just... You know, I guess you, it can't like radiate radiate away all of its energy, or it would be um, not scientifically useful. But um, really, really, really big collider. Oh, well, I did something. It's uh, maybe turning those on. I think it may, so you, if you, I bounce off it a little bit, yeah, you'd build just like the biggest, baddest, highest energy thing. And so, if that meant collider in oh, where would you build it? Collider in space. It's wherever. Um. In space is my, maybe the answer. Yeah, I think so. Like you would, I can't, what would you do? Maybe you could put, um, well, no, because you need, you need to steer the beams um, and you need them to not interact with anything else. So you actually have to be in pretty, pretty highly evacuated to do that. You know, like probably close to um, anywhere close to the Earth's, uh, the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere would not be a good place. So then you would need a tube that you'd have to put in space. So maybe that's not a great idea. You have to lift it up there. So maybe it is easier to do it on Earth. But you know, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of nowhere, where but there, I don't like think Texas. <laughs> I don't think you're under you're you're underappreciated. What unlimited budget means? <laughs> we can, if you pay enough <laughs> money, you can make anything happen. <clears throat> I'm trying to think, there are probably some uh, around the equator. Yeah. Like <laughs> Well, if you're wow. saying, yeah, I mean, if really unlimited budget, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, let's sure, shoot around shoot the, the equator, um, under the Pacific Ocean, you know, <laughs> just like on the floor of the ocean. See, now sometimes I end up out of it and I, I can no longer see myself. Maybe try that way. We haven't tried that corner yet. Yeah. I see. Around the equator. I mean, you run risks of heating and things like that. Like the heating mantle of the core would start to matter at that depth, but... I mean, you could build it over the ocean. Who cares? We have unlimited money. Let's build a bridge with a particle <laughs> accelerator. <laughs> I like it. All right. Maximum Minimus wants to know what was the what was the most successful collider and why? 
what was the most successful? Or what is? Good question. They all... <laughs> there it's isn't like, like one like... that kind of rules them all in terms of its contributions. Um, so, you know, you have the W and the Z come from uh, the SPP bar S. So let's see. The Tevatron is the top. We have eggs. <laughs> the answer is it's like trying to pick your favorite child. You shouldn't force this question on a particle yeah. physicist. <laughs> it's just cruel. And then there are things like, you know, the discovery of the the um, charm quark was done like independently at two colliders, you know, at the same time. Um, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but the the machine that was running at Slack in the 70s, probably 70s or 60s, it was a, um, I think it was an E plus E minus, um, and, I, and I believe it had, that might have been what I'm talking about with the JSI, but anyway, that was the, that was the way, um, that this whole field of like, um, you know, colliders as sources of high intensity photon radiation for other science started off um, for, you know, material science and condensed matter and biology. Um, and so in terms of like enabling the largest amount and breadth of science, maybe that one, but of course I can't remember the name of it, um, what it was called, but basically it was the, the big um, accelerator at Brookhaven, or excuse me, at um, Slack in the seventies. Oh, so I'm looking up the speed run right now. Okay. Go, go left. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I want to give us some direction here. Sure. You probably have to hit those things to go up. These, like, graves? I, I thought they were just part of the... I oh. don't know. So go up to this thing. Okay. And just maybe not that one. Sorry, we're troubleshooting here. So see this? Uh... This thing. Oh, I have to, again, it's I gotta go around and connect all the... Yep. Ah, yeah, yes. yeah. That'll give you some kind of some kind of doorway to go through. Oh. Sorry, we're distracted. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was the entirety of that level. I mean, if you know what you're doing, that's favorite. So I have there. to find the rings. All right. So most successful collider, mixed response. I mean, all of them do something, right? Exactly. At some level, you know, maybe the first one because it enabled the rest. <laughs> yeah, it was just a breakthrough in terms of, and I think you can do that with the other circles there too. Calm Down Bronco has an easy one for you. Favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> Calm Down Bronco is gonna hate me. I, uh, oh crap. Oh man. I have gone back, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. But at least I know how. Um. I am not a huge fan of ice cream. I know I it's think you have to go through this one. A little bit weird to say. And then go down. Like, yeah, oh yeah. We can go to something new here. Oh, the gr yellow one. Oh. Well, that's what the speed run did. I don't know okay. what the right answer is. Uh, <laughs> Favorite collider. If I <laughs> if I had a um, if I had to pick one, I think it would be uh, um, you know. Something with chocolate, not maybe not chocolate ice cream, but like vanilla with like chocolate bits or something in it. Um, but I am not a not a huge ice cream fan. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's. I'm the sorry. Most, calm most down, Bronco. Disappointing okay. answer of the yeah, night. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Oh look, favorite I'm collider flavor. Little people. <laughs> oh, electrons, obviously. Well, you know. <laughs> Except I've been working my whole career on hadron collider and yeah. on a hadron collider, and I have come to very much appreciate the um, how we have taken like a tough problem and made a lot out of it. Um, yeah. In fact, many of the arguments for the linear collider about precision on the Higgs couplings, I think while it's still better than the HLLHC, it's not by so much. And so the high luminosity, just just increasing the luminosity of the LHC actually can get you um, most of the way there in terms of precision, which I don't think 10 or 20 years ago people thought was true. I think it 
It's actually a testament to our work that we've solved a lot of the problems in terms of operating detectors and very high radiation damage, you know, that we can do this. And, you know, reconstructing very well and dealing with the computing and all of the different parts of... Hey. I wonder if I went back, though. Maybe you have to do the yellow one now. <clears throat> All right, we should do another prediction because we are running out of time. We have 45 minutes left. Which one do you want? Okay. Um, let's see. Kind of like this this one. Okay. It's a weird phrasing, but we'll see what people think. Yes. All right, imaginary internet points time. Let's spend them. Let's make decisions on scientific questions. Um, if you're not following, click the follow button, get your 300 standard internet units, and bet them accordingly on the science we are about to ask you. So we're going to give two minutes on this question. Uh, the question is, so there's matter and there's antimatter. And so there are theories that say this should be maximinimus. Thank you for the follow. There are theories that say there should be equal amounts of matter and antimatter. But presumably there is a scenario where there aren't equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And there is a probability that that exists. Am I understanding let, that correctly? Let me let me let me um, try to clarify this a little. Okay. That that scenario is true. Um, we live in the universe that is dominated by matter, not antimatter. All right. Uh, so even though the theory, the standard model of physics, treats the two as completely equal. All right. So so it is wrong. So what's what is this question adding? Matter antimatter asymmetry probability is it the same as being struck by lightning or picking a perfect March Madness bracket? And so that's the probability that it's the well, it's the the excess of matter over antimatter in the universe. I see, I see. Is it the same as I see, yeah. I get it. Okay, so it's the the excess of matter over antimatter. Is it the same as predicting March Madness brackets, or the same as being struck by light. Okay, that's interesting. I did not understand that question fully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you clarified it. All right, so place your bets now. There's clearly more matter than antimatter. <laughs> um, what is the ratio between the two? Is it equivalent to predicting a perfect March Madness bracket or being struck by lightning? <laughs> that's it's such an interesting comparison. I know. Matter, I, antimatter. I, is this a standard in your field, or is this just... Uh, it's an open question in our field. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of the, 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 the metrics, you know, like you can oh, put no. a number here. No, right? no. I mean, the number I know, but the, the, what it's closer to, I was trying to come up with something <laughs> that, you know, people could I see. understand, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, to try to quantify what that really means. Oh, there's a guy surfing you now. He's surfing me and I'm making plants grow. <laughs> I mean, it's probably get all these and then go in that door. If I've learned anything about this right. game, right? I don't see. Know. This is the like the the literature of video. You know, the language. Excuse me. What? Oh, now he picked what? up a cone of video games that I never really picked up as a child. But I'm getting a real crash course right now, so it's wonderful, and it's telling me. Oh, there's another person. Oh, oh wow! Is he bringing beckoning out, like, me through the door? A gift. Oh, we just oh. played matchmaker. Oh, I've got a, a friend. Now. I don't know what that I've is. Got a, I've got a, a girlfriend here. Cuddle puppy. I attempted <laughs> to understand the question, and now I'm in a coma. Now I'm bouncing <laughs> that was, again. It was a harsh question. Uh, all right. So, matter, anti matter, matter asymmetry. I guess we should have said ratio instead of probability. Would that have been more sense? Right. All right. So, is the answer struck by lightning right. or perfect March Madness bracket? We've got birds. Oh, look, they're flying now. And the answer is perfect March Madness bracket. And so the ratio or odds of getting struck, struck by lightning are one in a million. The odds of picking a perfect March Madness practice bracket, depending on your uh, knowledge, is one in 10 billion to one in 100 billion. And the excess of matter over antimatter in the universe that explains all of the matter in the universe, right? You, me, our planet, all the other planets, all the other stars, etc., is one part in 10 billion. One part in 10 billion. Mm -hmm. So and where so did it come it's from? It's not fully understood why that ratio exists, but that's fairly accepted. That's, exactly. That's the answer. Exactly. So wow. in a perfect symmetric you know again it's like the question of why do the fermions have mass in the perfect theory you know the simple theory you write down that is calculable um 
there's the same amount of matter as there is antimatter. They all meet, they all collide, they all annihilate to photons. Our universe has no chemistry, <laughs> just a bunch of photons sort of free streaming around. But that's not the universe we live in, right? Because there's just a tiny bit of, after all the collisions did happen, just a tiny bit of matter was left over to, to, be, to be the matter in the universe. And so there are some conditions that have to be met, certain uh, symmetries in the standard model to be violated and certain out of equilibrium conditions at the time of, you know, very early in the universe's history. And uh, people try to, you know, figure this out. Yeah, photons and dust. Exactly. <laughs> try to figure <laughs> this out and, um, and try to explain this, this asymmetry. <laughs> so just to, to introduce the audience to some uh, another interesting open question that cuts across astronomy and particle physics. Oh, uh, I'll give you something to chew on. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. what was the most memorable slash impactful moment of your scientific career? Memorable slash impactful. Um, I will say I'm going to answer the question that I wish he answered asked, <laughs> which was seven billion people on Earth. That means one of us is made of antimatter, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, all the antimatter is basically gone, the primordial antimatter at least, and it's only the, the matter left over. Um, most memorable part of my scientific career was um, what I would call, we called it the Higgs unblinding ceremony. So in, in particle physics, um, we study the, 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 the basic parameter of the problem is you have a rare signal and some large backgrounds. And you're looking for a tiny, tiny signal over very large backgrounds. And so you study and study your backgrounds very, very well and want to be able to predict exactly how many background events you should see. And then you try to, but you, you, you define a region of, of parameter space, an area that you're searching in um, that you're, you should have a lot of signal in and you should have background, but you don't study the backgrounds in that search region. You study it some other way, maybe from simulation, maybe from uh, some other games you play and try to convince yourself you understand the backgrounds and you only look in the actual search region at the very end because you don't want to bias yourself towards uh, over predicting the background and then not seeing a signal. So when you finally do look, you know, so-called open the box and look, that's called unblinding. And there was a meeting of the CMS um, Higgs physics group in, uh, I don't know, it would have been late spring, early summer of 2012, where they were going to unblind all the searches for the standard model Higgs boson. And it was an extremely well attended meeting. Normally you get, you know, 40 people. This was. 900, I think, you know, not all in one room. There were, um, there were, um, people on, on video before zoom. We, we were doing zoom before it was cool. Although it wasn't zoom anyway. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and just one by one, these groups presented, I mean, just unfailing ever evidence that the Higgs boson really did exist, <laughs> that they had seen it. Just one one analysis after another. They were all statistically independent. They were all done extremely carefully. Um, and they were all pointing to the very same thing, you know, a particle with a mass of about 125 billion electron volts. Um, that was very cool. That is probably the most memorable scientific moment. <laughs> was seeing that for real. Like, I mean, it was just like, cause you know, we had been searching and searching and um, just finding hints, but not enough and whatever for so long, you could start to convince yourself, eh, it's not really real, you know, we're just yet another year in this decades long search. Um, but then to actually see it and be like, oh no, it's real. <laughs> we really found it. Oh, Faithful Fairy has a follow-up to the previous discussion regarding matter and antimatter. There are 7 billion people on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> that means one of us is made of antimatter. <laughs> right. But who? <laughs> High five them, who see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I was saying before, it's that I think that all of the antimatter was annihilated, essentially, you know, in the time of the... Well, I guess when it happened, I think it's supposed to be at the time 
you know, long before even the cosmic microwave background. Hey, go get that. Yeah, help me here. Okay. Cuddle Puppy says they're carrying Cuban cigars. Yeah. I wonder if you can pick up another one. No. I seem to be have. Oh, I no. must need another person, maybe. <laughs> this game, I, I don't know. Might have to use this to replace NARC as a mainstay. <laughs> Oh, look at that. That did something. Oh, by the way, if you want to switch to NARC, I'm fully... 1024. <laughs> Let's do one more prediction before okay. we switch games. I'm not sure I'll make it to the next level of this. <laughs> there are a lot of people I wish were made of antimatter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, just throw a ball at them and they yeah, just exactly. explode. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We got two left. Which one do you want to do? Um, how about the bottom one? All right. All right, I'll have you explain this because I don't want to screw it up. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> I think I understand. And I, I didn't know how if we would get more into sort of the details of the detector in this conversation. So this is kind of playing to that. Um, so the data acquisition system of uh, the CMS detector <clears throat> is going to be upgraded for this high luminosity LHC uh, and to have a higher throughput. And so the question is, is the throughput we are planning for equivalent to um, global internet traffic, so that's all internet traffic in 2009, or global internet traffic in 2017. So this is data per interval of time? This is um, in like, yeah, like bits per second or bytes per second or... So all internet traffic in 2009 versus 2017. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to know context, what that is, is I looked up these numbers, I presumably mm -hmm. you're okay with these. So in 2009, that was 176 exabytes. So that's 10 to the 18th bytes. And in 2017, that was 1,200 exabytes. So roughly 10 times more in 2017 than 2009. So. Man, that's exabytes. That is a number. I don't think I've dealt with 10 to the 18th. But this is, well, this is over a whole year, I assume. Yeah. Because the number I got was per, like, per unit time. So I of course, see. I yeah. see. You divide by a year. I think I looked at numbers and it was like per month. I see. So if you run CMS for a year, <laughs> this mm -hmm. answer is okay. Yeah, exactly. For, for you know, a year, like, really, like, you know, mm -hmm. Actually non acquiring. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the acquisition rate. All right. We're, we're torn on this. It's basically 50-50 <laughs> right okay. now. Okay. So good question. This one was... Not enough meta information to guess the answer right away. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten no farther on no the- No further. Oh wait, there are people. Disappear? More people. Oh, oh, wait. Where'd she go? Thought we were gonna catch her. If I think if you release these, she might go too. How do I? See, the thing is we don't know what's actually Oh, there was something with X before. Let's see. I just cuddle puppy at some point. I'm going to have to cut you off. Exabytes is what happens when one of my oh. ex's puppies, girlfriends, bites me. No. <laughs> That's too much of a dad joke, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the answer is the CMS data acquisition per given time is going to be equivalent to 2009 total internet traffic or 2017 total internet traffic. The answer is 2009. So yeah, not as much of a leading question as the others, yeah. but uh, I thought that was interesting because that's a big data acquisition system. <laughs> Even in 2009, the global internet traffic was not nothing. Um, also, it has grown quite a bit yeah. since then. But yeah, so um, this detector is going to process, what is it? Um, it's going to write seven and a half megabytes per event to tape with a rate of uh, approximately 10, uh, 10 kilohertz. Anyway, All right. so it's a lot. <laughs> Are you ready for NARC? Yes. I think it's time. I will pause that guy and we will get okay. to everyone that's familiar with Ask a Scientist Gaming. We typically close the night with a game called NARC. This is something I played as a child. It is a bargain bin game. Uh, it's a clear example why we lost the war on drugs. Um, but here it is. 
Um, just say no license plate clearly. <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> Rachel, it's all yours. <laughs> okay. Um, but I have set up a timer, so we're going to time how long it takes. So it turns out I speed run this game. I run it as fast as I possibly can to beat other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I Calm down, my Brecca. cool my cool car. And I'm supposed to just... Oh, wait. B? No. What happened? Uh, start button. There you go. Ah, okay. So A and B. B jumps if you tap oh, yeah. it, but if you hold B, it squats. I'm just going to shoot everybody. That's yeah. what you told me. <laughs> well, it's basically walk right, because killing people doesn't help you do anything. Cuddle Puppy is right. Narc is pretty much a documentary on modern, modern criminal justice. That is absolutely so. <laughs> but I'm the cop, or yes. okay. You're going in that door. Oh yeah, right and there. these are the these are the um, the drug dealers the drug that dealers. are also flashers for some reason. Yeah, why do they look coats? like like old men in <laughs> trench coats? Yeah, because they they are. Was this a game like? made by a, some government program, you know, like... <laughs> it it might have been. So this was an arcade game originally, and it was on one of the stand-up arcades, and it had... The gameplay was much better on the arcade, but then they ported it to Nintendo. So there's a car right there that you have to grab. Okay. But when they ported it to Nintendo, it lost a lot of the quality. Um, and so, yeah, this is what we ended up with. But this started, like, the... I don't know, the war on video games and video game violence and really? all sorts of things. This? This is one of the earliest games <laughs> that was controversial. Oh no, I died. I mean... Oh yeah, are, but I can't you, die, right? You are shooting dogs and you are murdering people and exploding them. Eh, a little controversy. Kill you, dog. So if you hold B, you can squat and shoot. Yep, just like that. <laughs> is the dog bumping my leg? Uh, oh. Oh. So the, those of you that are regulars to this game, so about a month ago, I got basically challenged by people in chat to speed run this game. So Rachel, if you're not familiar, there's a huge community right now that runs video games as fast as they can, mm -hmm. right? And so you just figure out every glitch and nuance you can to just go faster. So they challenged me to speed run this because there's only 10 people on the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. As of three days ago, as far as I know, I have the fastest defeat of this game congratulations <laughs> and so it still has to be verified by the officials the previous record was nine minutes and 28 seconds and mine is now 9 24 seconds oh you can be beat the whole game in 10 minutes yep yeah i'm guessing it'll take you without direction something like 20 minutes there's a, there's a <laughs> level where you're gonna crash a car and that sucks <laughs> but yeah if it's I don't know, I committed, this has been a theme on Ask a Scientist Gaming to beat NARC, because why not win the war on drugs every single Ask a Scientist? <laughs> yeah, especially at the quack stop. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, quack. <laughs> oh, I'm buying quack? Oh, I see. <laughs> yep, it's a non It was so bad in those days you could just buy it at a store. <laughs> well, my favorite part of this game is these guys are just shooting syringes of heroin at you for free. Oh, are they? Is that what that is? It's a syringe. I don't know oh, what's in gosh. it. Oh, <laughs> gosh. This really looks like either a, an ill-fated government program to, like, reach the youth Yeah, or exactly. No, we're cool. Or... Say no to drugs or, uh, and blow them up. <laughs> or, like, uh, some very smart, like, seven-year-old's, like, first foray into video you know, <laughs> games. Like, Harsh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, uh, check what I did with my calculator. Look. <laughs> but, uh, this, is, this is the, uh, you gotta be the appropriate amount of drunk to truly appreciate this game. So you have to kill the guys in black, the, oh. the hypo mans, and, and when you do, so you just busted him. But when you kill them, one of them will drop a blue card. I see, okay. So yeah, and this is random odds. I, I won't get into the details because I figured out a lot of this while playing the game. Uh, and my brother's actually working on uh, reverse engineering the game to figure out what makes it run. <laughs> so we take this very seriously, but fun factoid, even though it only says 99 bullets, you can have up to 2,000 in the code. Oh, you might have the blue card already. Try that door right there. Card slit, see if that... Oh, oh there yeah. we go. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. We have about a half hour left. Um, my guest today is Rachel Yohei. She's an expert in particle physics, particle accelerators, all things smashing particles and atoms together to try to figure out what makes the universe work. Um, if you have questions, please throw them in chat right now. We're happy to answer those while we win the war on drugs by 
I don't know, shooting flashers. This is NARC. If you haven't seen yeah. it before, it's a spectacular game. Everyone should speedrun and try to beat my record. That is still not verified after a while, but it'll be verified eventually. All right. So, questions on particle physics? If not, I am happy to ask some more of my questions. All right. So there's a fairly recent Nobel Prize for particle physics. What's the next Nobel Prize? Oh. That's a good question. Well, I guess because... a, a, it's a two-part question. Has, it, has the discovery happened already, or is there a pending discovery? I think it... I personally think it hasn't happened already. I think the Higgs Nobel Prize... Um, that's sort of, I mean, that's been in the works for decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever the next the next thing we, if, if we can start to understand these disparate energy scales in the standard model and, um, or how we can make the theory explain higher, you know, much higher energy scales than we can right now. Um, if we could solve the problem of identifying dark matter, or is he my friend or my enemy? They are all your. They are all your enemy. Okay. Yep. Um, identifying the nature of dark matter, that would be a Nobel Prize, I think. But we're not, we are not there. Um, so I don't know what it will be. I don't think there's an experimental technique out there right now that would qualify. And I think even to do that, so you have to jump over to jump. this. So That's B? tap B. Yep. Oh, okay. While pressing right. Yep. Oh, you just stand next to it. You don't have to run oh, okay. time. It. Just, yep, and press right. You're on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> physics. Physics, <laughs> okay. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Video game physics. Just walking over oh. a really long bridge here. All right. Calm down. Bronco wants to know, can we create matter from energy? If so, how? Yes. In fact, that's the whole principle on which uh, the LHC or any collider rests. So you have two very energetic two very energetic um, particles coming at each other and the energy of their interaction uh, can be converted into uh, an equivalent or, you know, equivalent, equivalent or less um, massive particle. And somebody, oh, somebody said something before, just multiply by C squared. Mm -hmm. and, and exactly. So yeah. it's E equals MC squared. That's exactly it. That's the fundamental expression of the relationship between energy and mass. <laughs> like these dogs, they're they're gaining mass here, isn't they? <laughs> and they're phasing out of reality. So you have to hold B to squat and then hold A to shoot, and just hold those down. <laughs> oh, bye, dogs. <laughs> yep. Well, you turned them into puppies, so that's fine. Oh. You didn't actually kill the dogs. <laughs> there they are. Oh yeah. Oh, this game. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so silly. So so here's what I'll say about this game. So I got a challenge a month ago to speedrun this game. And I, I attacked that problem just like I would any scientific research project. <laughs> the first thing I did was I looked at how other people were running the game. Right? Uh -huh. See how they did it, how, what rules they followed, what things they learned. And then I started practicing. And so I got good at the things they did. And then I explored the space that they hadn't explored. Like trying new things like what governs when the card appears, what governs when the boss appears. And then you just find the rules that manipulate this universe. And you utilize those rules to run it as fast as possible. So that's why I say, especially to my Gen Chem students, like gaming is an awesome example of scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not the rules of our universe, it's the rules of the gaming universe. So that's my spiel. Everyone should speed run games because it's science. <laughs> now, do many games lead you down as many, you know, sometimes blind alleys and, you know, I make you think you're making progress when you're not as, <laughs> you know, science sometimes does i i think it's more i mean there was an intended pathway so i i think this is more forgiving than our scientific mm -hmm. endeavors right because mm -hmm. there's there is an end to this there's a clear end goal i think what these games do is there are pathways that the developers designed that they wanted you to follow mm -hmm. what most of speedrunning is figuring out how to break that system 
And so there are ways to like in Super Mario Brothers where you can go down a pipe and thinks you're going up a vine because of the actions you did before it. And so it's it's much more A to B, but figuring out loopholes to get between those paths much faster. And I think that one of the people on the chat is uh, is is saying that one of the things I'm apparently missing is that I'm supposed to <laughs> yeah, pick up a car. car. <laughs> I mean, I was going to tell you that, but the harsh reality I is... I just figured there would eventually be a... Uh, everyone that gets in the car ends up smashing the car like <laughs> three seconds later, so it's just not worth it. But oh, really? Yeah, Rob, you are right. There's a very specific car pattern, so if you go down, you can walk this entire thing. Instead of oh, jumping all of them. Okay. Yeah, the 3D-ness is a little bit... Yeah, just keep walking. I see. <laughs> is this supposed to be like towers of money or They're drugs or something? They're supposed to be dumpsters, actually. <laughs> I know this game's not realistic. All right, we're, we're, we're speedrunning NARC as fast as possible, but we're also asking, answering questions on particle physics and particle accelerators. If you have questions, feel free to throw them in chat. <laughs> hey Rob, that's the moment I enjoy is when you <laughs> crash into the dumpsters with the car. <laughs> uh, that's appreciated. Ooh, the most important question of the night. Cuddle Puppy wants to know. Puppies or kittens, dogs or cats? Uh this is the question you're gonna be judged on most tonight, actually. Really? <laughs> I um I would say Cats, cats, and puppies. Oh, that's interesting. You, you <laughs> divided the domains. This one I have to jump over. Yep. Yeah. Calm, calm down, Bronco. Thank you for stopping by. Always a pleasure. Again, oh, in two weeks, we swing by. Uh, our guest in two weeks will actually be Walter Boot, who's a cognitive psychologist. Mm. Believe it or not, he studies video games and learning via video games, particularly the elderly and maintaining cognitive abilities. So we'll see you in two weeks when you swing by for that. Oh, oh now yeah. I have to shoot clowns. Yeah, clowns with time. You know, classic drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know when we're going to end in our tradition. This, this... Oh, I'm in the red light district. Yep. And Can the, I get out? In the arcade game, you actually have hookers on the street, <laughs> but not in the uh, NES version of it. <laughs> and now, like, giant Dr flying cockroaches are going to... You got to go through that door. Drug bugs. <laughs> oh, no, you went back in. Oh, no. So... Far right. Uh, out that I'm door. getting stung by drug bugs. <laughs> <laughs> drug bugs. <laughs> no, let me walk. They had those balloons for multiple reasons, exactly. <laughs> I expect the opposite, because puppies chew everything. Oh my god, why do I keep. But cats are openly sociopathic. <laughs> it's true. It's like living in Florida. <laughs> I. <laughs> They're <Yeah>. not wrong. <laughs> they really are not wrong. Okay. Keep okay. going. Wait. It's going to be the door on the far right. Puppies or kitties? I've, um... <laughs> Is A-Rob somebody, uh... That's one of my grad students. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> he's, he's a moderator <laughs> of the chat. He helped me I create see. Ask a Scientist Gaming. Um, oh, how did I... But I came back. Did you get a card out of that? I... So go right. There should be a card on the ground up here. Nice. <laughs> oh, I see. Yep. There we go. And can I go in this yep. door? Okay. That's it. <laughs> yeah. They regularly retweet my advertisements for Ask a Scientist Gaming College of Arts and Sciences. I would love for a dean to swing by and see this. Yeah. <laughs> and or yeah, be a guest. Yeah, you know. Someone maybe has. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I will definitely. I told my... Um, Uh-oh. My whole, um, my subgroup to, uh, ah, I hold, I told my, uh, subfield that I was doing this, uh, subgroup and, uh, they were pretty. So, so, so physics department is interesting. So chemistry, we have like inorganic biological, we have organic, they're, they're kind of blurry lines between the two, but physics, you're very disparate because you have astrophysics, particle physics, condensed matter physics. 
That's what you mean by subgroup? Yes, yeah, so I told the high energy physics group, I both see. the theorists and experimentalists. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so hopefully, if you stopped by. I mean, yeah, it, it, anyone in the audience knew as well, Rachel. If you guys know somebody that would, might be a good guest for Ask a Scientist Gaming that likes to play and wants to talk some science, it's the only level you go left on. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you only looking for faculty or. Yes. Probably better. I mean, it, there's yeah. a lot of students that would do it, but I think there's some weight to faculty embarrassing themselves on video games. Yes. <laughs> oh, I gotta get a green card. Okay. Oh, no. I gotta walk yeah. this way. So you'll have to shoot all of the guys that are Rambo looking. Oh, God, their heads. Just... Yeah, let's get the new president. He is a chemist, actually. Yeah. Uh, as of, what, two days ago, he officially started? exciting that we have a scientist as yeah. the president. <laughs> what about medical doctors or ju judicial degrees? Ah. I am I am happy to. I gotta update the schedule. I think the most diverse person we have coming in, we have biologists, chemists, physicists. Um, we will have a statistician coming. In, oh, that'll be good. Kind of fun. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like, you know, how does you know the public mislead and use statistics for manipulation of data? I think that'll be a really interesting. Question. <laughs> so you can't rocket them to get the card. Uh, you have to bullet them by holding. Yep. Holding A. Yep. Okay. Yep, and just unload on them. <laughs> ah, this must be it. No, it's something else. Oh, what's the quote on stats? Oh, uh, in terms of you can use them to manipulate anything, something along those lines. Yeah, you can. <laughs> lies, damn lies, and statistics. And statistics, yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, but there's people that do this for a living, and they're getting better at analyzing data and finding out what's real and what's not. Yeah, it's why it's it's important that um, sometimes this happens with, um, you know, maybe with younger students who are just so bogged down in learning um, just the technical details of how to analyze the data mm -hmm. or make the measurements. And this can be in any field that... Um, you sometimes kind of focus so much on the statistical technique and not on what is it actually saying? What's yeah. the interpretation? The interpretation is kind of an artful mix of the, the mathematics, the technique, and also, I don't know, some Bayesianism. Like, what are, what is, what's your prior for yeah. how true this is? Or, you know, what's how... Real? And yeah, what are your, um, how well do you know the experiment that you're doing? So I guess I just keep shooting until this card so I'm going to give away up. something I learned about the physics of this universe. So you can shoot the guys, but you need to be on the far left side of the screen, and you need <laughs> to shoot them within a certain radius for them to have a probability to drop the card. So, so they've restricted the space in which okay. you can get a card. <laughs> and this is me applying my PhD in chemistry to beating NARC as fast as possible. All right. This is some of the stuff that I've learned. 90% <laughs> of statistics are made up on the spot, and 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> that is accurate application of statistics, and I'm sure you guys should save those questions for our statistics guests. <laughs> uh, Alright, we have one more prediction we can throw up. Are you ready for this? Energetic cosmic ray shower? <laughs> every 60 minutes in Africa, time advances an hour. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Truth being spoken in Ask a Scientist Gaming Chat. Alright. So they don't let me do carrots in... Oh, let me see if it does on this. Because I think it, like, negates it when I actually post it. I have to be all the way on the left? How does an, a normal... Like, you just, you just keep doing this until... Shoot the card. Shoot the guys until a card drops from them. It's... I have a very particular way to do this quickly, but... Uh. Alright, so the, the, the prediction is up. So we have we can measure um, cosmic ray showers. This this is just cosmic radiation. Presumably this is from the sun, this particular incident. But there are cosmic ray showers that are very, very energetic. So the question here is, how does that energy compare to the energetics of the Large Hadron Collider beam energy? And so is it 10 to the 7th times greater? Or is it 10 to the minus 7 times lower than the Large Hadron Collider beam energy? And so this is basically comparing, and correct me if I'm wrong in explaining this, 
Uh, I think, yeah, except the... Actually, I'll get you a card. <laughs> the cosmic <laughs> rays... <laughs> the cosmic rays can come from... Um, actually, these very high-energy ones are thought not, I think, not to come from our galaxy. Oh, I see. From, That's from really... Our <laughs> galaxy. That's so weird. Did they mean for that to happen? For yeah, the like, restricted area. They have to only be in the left and... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, these poor guys designing this in the 1980s, like... Yeah. The rules weren't established. There was... Yeah. I don't I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I, I know way more about this game than any human being should. All right. Was there a guess so, to Oh, sorry. Throw your predictions in there. The 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 most energetic cosmic rays that have hit Earth that we have measured is it 10 to the minus 7 times the beam energy of LHC or is it 10 to the 7th? So is it 7 order magnitude greater or is it 7 orders of magnitude lower than the LHC beam energy? Hotel snob. <laughs> that, that was the <laughs> it's the details in this game that really make it yep. worthwhile <laughs> big bang all right the, 24 hour cash all right the prediction is closing so is it 10 to the minus 7th the lhc or is it 10 to the 7th lhc this is scary mr big international <laughs> that's the big boss man <laughs> All right, so Rachel, what's the answer? 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the 7? 10 to the plus 7. 10 to the plus 7. So everyone almost got that one right. It's Gusbot, thank you for the skeptical guess. <laughs> but yeah, most people guessed um, 10 to the 7. And so that the cosmic rays that we have measured are 10 to the 7 times more powerful than our fastest particle accelerator. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, it's almost not by accident that they, the way we measure these cosmic rays is through air showers. So basically the whole Earth, Earth's atmosphere acts as the calorimeter. Uh, mm. The particle with this much energy comes in, starts interacting with the Earth's atmosphere and showering into less energetic secondary particles and those shower and those showers. And, and these um, showers can spread over kilometers uh, and I thought of this question so I guess I have to find something that yeah red safe card um, so you have a red card actually oh do these, I these next several uh, doors until the boss you will so um sorry just reading this thing. I guess oh, no, you can see important. it in the background it, it's yeah, part okay. of the lore it's part of the narrative <laughs> I don't think you'll understand the story unless you read it. <laughs> right. <them. Sorry. laughs> um, when the LHC first uh, started, uh, there was a group, maybe it wasn't a group, maybe it was just one person, trying to sue to... Do I have a blue card? Yep. Oh. Ah, okay trying to sue to stop it from operating, saying that it would, um, the energy was so high that it would create a black hole black that hole. would destroy yeah. the Earth. And one of the arguments, I think that was even presented on the John Oliver segment on The Daily Show at the time, when they <laughs> interviewed <laughs> at, uh, at CMS. Where, where did I go? Oh, I'm getting killed by, um... The clown. I, I just, I want to get him. <laughs> <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> was that if that was true, it should have already happened because we've detected cosmic rays with far, far, far greater energy. Oh, that's a, already, that's a fun argument. Already, and nothing has happened. So, yeah. you know, if it's going to happen, we need a lot more energy or a much higher rate. I mean, that's crazy. 10 to the 7th times more powerful. Yeah. And this is really... a particular cosmic event that hit us? Exactly, yeah. You can, with these air showers, I mean, they just reconstruct these hits in, in detectors that are spread over kilometers and try to reconstruct the energy mm -hmm. of the particle. And they're also interesting. I mean, here's where, I don't know if, I don't know if it would be um, Dave or one of the other astronomers, but there, there's not a... All right, oh, so, so now twist on the storyline, yeah. you have to rocket the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> in, uh, not him. Presumably, earlier this morning, you did not anticipate you were going to close your mouth oh. by rocketing somebody in a wheelchair, but that is how Mark closes. Now it doesn't feel like a government project. It I mean, feels it like will it in a second, so go right. Where is he? He's going to be over here somewhere. Okay. All right. Um, oh, there he is. 
fucked up. So just fire rockets everywhere. Hope a rocket hits it. Oh, sorry, I keep thinking I'm doing that. Alright, Hamsterlicious wants to know, which is your preferred conceptual approach to probability theory? Bayesian or frequentist? I think in jet. I mean, uh... So, in our field, we use... Oh, there you go. I now watch it. an inchworm. <laughs> we use frequentist, but I think in general usage... I Where did I get the thing? Did I get it? Yeah, but two more... Oh, there's two more wheelchair, wheelchair guys. guys. Okay. Yep. Same wheelchair guy. He goes back to get a wheelchair with guns <laughs> to attack you. For, uh, for general purpose, I think Bayesian. That's the go-to? I think so, yeah. I mean, that's a big thing in your field, right? Knowing statistically whether something's significant or not. Right. And and we, we, we use a frequentist approach, but to me, it becomes just a mathematical... Because we... We have pretty extremely standardized oh, nice shot. techniques across even the two LHC experiments for exactly how we treat different kinds of priors. Excuse me, uh, exactly how we treat um, nuisance parameters and the exact type of the frequentist treatment, um, the, the way that we present our, uh, you know, constraints on you know, either what we saw or what we didn't see, constraints on what we didn't see. And so it's very easy to to compare across experiments and even to compare the same experiment across time and kind of like know what you're looking at. Um, but I think, yeah, for general, general scientific usage, you have to sort of have the prior, you know, have the, mm -hmm. the Bayesian look. Oh, there he is. There. Bayesian outlook on life. <laughs> oh, or on what you're doing. Uh, so Bayesian is the default for actually confirming things. Well, I, would, doing. I would say it's it's the, the, the general purpose scientific, but in our in our field it's actually frequentist. Okay. Oh fun factoid for everyone. If you want to speed run this game, oh go back, oh, go back, oh, go back. Oh. He's gonna make a card. Oh, yeah. Off screen it disappears. Oh I see, but I think I got it. Right there. But how did I... Fun factoid for how anyone that's going to speedrun this. Um, if you despawn him off the left side of the screen and stop him from doing his inchworm to the right, you actually change his spawn times. I think oh, I nice. finally got it. You did. Now you're ready for the big boss man. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> well, while fighting the big boss man, we have another question from Hamsterlicious. Um, the question is, when you say calorimetry, is that implying there's some type of temperature sensing involved to determine the energy of a particle shower? Uh, good question. Um, no, I'm not using calorimeter in the temperature sense, but in, in you know, temperature is a measure of energy. And if you think about, um, you know, the... Uh, you know, your Boltzmann statistics. So KT, the Boltzmann constant times temperature, and Kelvin gives you a, an energy, mm -hmm. right? So that's the conversion, right, between temperature and energy. So I, uh, who is this? <laughs> Sorry, I just. <laughs> so that's the wheelchair guy. Oh that no! Turned into just... a giant head oh. that shoots tongues at you, Mr. Big. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you battle this for a while. The the key is you have to hit him in the top hat with a rocket and then in the face with a rocket two or three times. Okay. This, uh, like I said, scientific method. There are rules to this universe. They don't make sense to us, but they hold true consistently. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, so we, we say calorimeter because it is measuring, basically energy is temperature, but yeah, it is an energy measuring device, but we're not actually measuring the temperature of anything. We're using different techniques to get at the energy. <laughs> I would say not. <laughs> I'm a natural born... <laughs> Speedrunner this game. Slow. I don't even I know. Mean, am I shooting? Like I don't. Yeah, no, you're hitting oh, him with okay. rockets. It's a, it's a really hard because you have to jump and hit him with a rocket. Oh. You want me to get his hat off, and we'll get you to step two. Sure. All right. Yeah. Then it becomes like the button. Yeah. The button there's, mashing. There's a, there's a dexterity associated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whoop. Nope. Now it's too close. This is something modern gaming you can do save states where you can basically get to this fight right okay so i shot his glasses off now it's rockets to the face until he turns into something else but remind me the rockets are a, a. there it is 
All right. Oh! Now it's bullets to the spine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are coming to the end of Ask a Scientist Game Room with Rachel Yohei. She is about to beat Mr. Big and solve the win the war on drugs. Uh, if anyone has suggestions of people we should raid, please throw them in chat right now. Preferably science-related streams. Um, but again, we're happy to raid anyone that might appreciate a few people to follow or a few people to show up in their streams. So throw those in chat right now if you have anyone any favorites. I'd be happy to happy to raid them. Um, Okay, that makes sense. I'm currently studying maximum entropy, so the concept of what temperature is has become under scrutiny again. Huh. I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> this is really what it takes to stop a drug dealer. Yes. <laughs> you know. Why am uh, I so punching him? How did I... Bullets instead of rockets. So holding A. Holding yep. A. And you got to be a certain distance away. Right, that's this what I... Is, I got to get, like... Yeah, so you're dead now. Jump, yeah. Run away and jump. And then turn back and shoot. This this is the jankest boss fight I've ever seen in video gaming. I don't know the rules. I... Yeah. I apologize for doing this to you. <laughs> but if no, you it's okay. Want, I, 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 uh... So it's like, you have to go down and then up at certain times and shoot him at the right time. It is just crazy. But yeah, this is Mr. Big. This is Ask a Scientist Gaming. We close the night with NARC where we win the war on drugs by beating the skeleton head with, I don't know, laser eyes. It's like he has no powers anymore. So I don't yeah. know how threatening he is What's he, he is really doing, boss. even? <laughs> and what does he have to do with drugs? <laughs> you know... The eternal boogeyman of drugs. Might as well manifest drugs as a are skull. Bad. It, yeah, exactly. They're so bad. Yeah, this Nancy Reagan wrote this game. <laughs> <laughs> so we take it as it is. This is your brain on drugs. Is exactly. I'd buy that. drugs from a guy like that. Yeah, <laughs> true. He's probably got pretty good drugs. I, was gonna say, I mean, you might not need drugs if you see that on your street corner. So <laughs> it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, oh my. Any ideas who we're going to raid? I'll look up people. So there's something called the Knowledge Fellowship, if you guys haven't heard of it. There's a lot of science streamers on Twitch. Um, they typically don't play video games. They might teach lectures and stuff like that. But here's a link to the Discord for Knowledge Fellowship or the website that gives you a link to the Discord. But there's a lot of science streamers that, I mean, need support. They're not going to have 20,000 viewers, but they're going to do things like show math lectures or answer physics questions or teach chemistry. Um, there's other ones that are actually applied crafts like um, glass blowing or woodworking or um, just people that really want to generally educate and walk people through the exercises they're doing. So, yeah, check out the Knowledge Fellowship. Um, there's a few people on there now that I might think about raiding. Sid Percy is doing science and technology. Let me see what he's up to. Oh, wait, am I getting him? No. Oh. I thought he was starting to look like... Damn. Am I actually hitting him? Uh, you'll see the spinal cord blow up. So I'd recommend running away and then shooting backwards, but like do it down here somewhere. He keeps following me. Yeah. Is that that's yep. that's part that's, of what he does? Yeah, exactly. But if I'm like on the same line as him, like then I'm I'm I, I should be able to. Yeah. So go go further away and then turn back. Then move up a little bit. Then just turn back and hold the bullets. Yep. So stop there. Go up a little. Stop and shoot this way. Stop moving. Yep. Sometimes his spine blows up for some arbitrary reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The hitbox is right under the base of his skull, absolutely. <laughs> Rachel, I'm really sorry we did this to you. Oh, that's I, fine. I can take over at any point if that's you want, fine. but basically run away, move up, turn back and shoot. Sometimes it hits right. Again, the rules. Has are... anyone ever gotten it? Bes yeah, um, the answer is yes. Yeah, well, okay. I've it's gotten cool. it. I don't know if I've had a guest beat this boss without assistance. Because okay. it, it, it is so jank and broken. Even with infinite lives, it's really hard to do. <laughs> so, Hamsterlicious, you're going to try speedrunning an arc? You should join me in the I endeavor. have to wait for when he's down low. Yep. But you have to be, like, right. far away, so right. run over. Yep. Ah. <laughs> All right, you gotta find somebody. 
Okay. Um, I hit him? But anyone, last minute questions. Rachel is still battling Mr. Big. Just bullets, not rockets. Oh. Um, if you have any last minute questions about particle physics, particle accelerators, anything you want to know about colliding <laughs> particles in together really quickly. Um, <laughs> Mac I beg to differ. More visually beautiful than Hoakum. <laughs> uh, 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 that, that quote is going in the books. <laughs> It really is a work of art, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Hoke Hokum. You should probably watch the speed run just to see what I think the I will are. now, now that like, I know a there little are more. Levels. Yeah. So you guys have we a PlayStation? Can you play that game? Yes, we have it at home. Okay. Because um, it is beatable, I unplug the whole thing and bring it over here. That's why I, <laughs> oh, I see. pretended that I... <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, it is very cool. <laughs> Can we put Mr. Big into the LHC? Oh, uh, please. Here, put him in. <laughs> All right. All right. See? All right. So, so I'm going to do a save state quick and show you guys how to beat this boss. And so you have to jump and hit him in the hat, which is non-trivial in itself, right there. And then a couple of rockets to the face. And I don't know exactly when he triggers, but he does. Then you gotta hit, like, move at the right time, so it breaks the spinal cord, and then move to a new position. That wasn't right, so I'll try it again. So you, you yeah, you are, like, get, getting one vertebrate as, at yeah. a time. Yeah, and you have to be at, like, the right position horizontally, Duh. and then you'll eventually get up, and that's... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this, so you can close out the game now. <laughs> it's because because the next room is our favorite room of the game. Hamsterlicious, thank you for the hundred bits. We always appreciate your support. Again, it's paying for beer tonight, which I will put in chat right now. If you guys are interested in a a nice Hefeweizen, we really enjoyed this drink. Um, oh, now I got all the money. And your Rouse whistle. So this is civil forfeiture level. So you don't have to go through any legal process of any kind. Just confiscate all of their gold and move on with your life. Because they definitely are like James Bond villains. Yeah, exactly. Have they have twenty-four thousand right. dollar gold blocks everywhere. <laughs> but um, yeah, this this is it. Narc is coming to an end. The last level, and then the clock stops when you hit the gold card. So you had thirty-six minutes and forty-eight seconds. So the current with, world record with, with significant cheats. help it could have been infinite <laughs> yeah that was true <laughs> um so yeah the current world record is nine minutes and 24 seconds if it gets approved all right well make sure to run, read the the lore i mean clearly you're cut off for being a dea agent is what this because that's always, always what i <laughs> when i was a kid i i Astronaut, <laughs> DEA agent. paleontologist, I mean, DEA agent. Yeah, you could still change careers. Uh, <laughs> cooking without looking—that's always a fun one. And uh, Sid Heresy, do you want to do you want to raid somebody that is a is blind but shows how they cook while they're blind, hmm. or someone who does like electronics and soldering and things? Hmm. Which one would you rather raid? What do you mean raid? So it's basically our audience will go raid somebody else. Oh. And you should put your initials in and take credit for your I, victory. I think I would be interested in the blind cook. All right. Oh, no. well. Let's do it. All right, so we're going to raid um, Cooking Without Looking. Um, I think they just started fairly recently. Thank you, Uncle Bill, for that suggestion. Uh, everyone, again, thank you for joining us at Ask a Scientist Gaming. Rachel, is a pleasure to have you. We had a journey through Pac-Man, Tetris, Hohokam, as well as winning the war on drugs. So it was a pleasure to have you. It was great talking about particle physics, your favorite <laughs> particles, as well as particle accelerators. <laughs> um, and you only get three? Yeah, I, I, I just, I think I just realized that. Yeah. Uh, a, maybe. A? Okay. <laughs> Top score. You won the war on drugs. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> and next time I ask you what's your pinnacle achievement in science, it's probably beating NARC during Ask a Scientist Gaming. But again, congratulations. It's been a pleasure to have you. Um, any parting words for the audience? Uh, stay tuned next week or next two weeks. Yeah, it be? two weeks from now, two it's... weeks on Wednesday. Stay tuned. You're bound to meet um, better game players and probably better scientists, too. But certainly, <laughs> I, I like to think, you know, equally interesting. <laughs>
Yeah, let's be honest, neither of those statements are probably true. Most of our <laughs> gameplay is, in fact, mediocre. But in two weeks from now, we'll have Walter Boot, who is a cognitive psychologist who studies actually learning through video games, which is kind of crazy. Ask Scientist Gaming will actually have a gaming researcher who doesn't actually play video games. He's going to be playing Sonic the Hedgehog on Sega Genesis. So that should be a pretty fun start to, to gameplay. But um, again, thank you for stopping by. It's always a pleasure. Your questions are what, really what make this stream work. So... We really appreciate you guys showing up, and so we really enjoy our time. Um, so in two weeks, we'll see you guys again. Until then, uh, we'll call it quits and stick around. We're going to raid Cooking Without Looking. All right. See you guys later.